and we're live. And with that, good morning, everyone. I will kick off this uh, morning meeting of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. We have a jam-packed filled day of uh, public hearings in front of us. Uh, but before we jump into that, we're going to do committee introductions. For folks who are not only on this committee, but used to watching committee, we've had a few changes over the past few days. So I'd be remiss without saying that uh, first off, I'm Senator Maddie Daughtry. I represent Senate District 24, which are the communities of Brunswick, Harpswell, North Yarmouth, Freeport, and Powell. And it is my deep honor to be the new chair of this committee. I'm really excited to be here with all of you and am grateful to Senator Hickman's guidance to uh, make sure that you know there's a smooth transition and excited for him to be stepping into Senator Lucchini's shoes over on VLA. So please uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'm really looking forward to this and um, you know, please reach out if you have any tips or tricks and hopefully this is like riding a bicycle that it'll all come back to me pretty quickly. Um, with that, I will pass it over to my house chair, Representative Sylvester to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Senator Dyer. We will certainly welcome you uh, onto the committee and uh, Senator Hickman, we're very excited for you to go to your first love uh, VLA, and uh, we know you're going to do great work over there, and we're glad that you're uh, you're here with us today. Um, and we want to also just say, uh, you know, farewell to uh, Senator Miramont, uh, who has been a, a, a very vital part of this committee, and we we appreciate all the work that he's done uh, on his time here. I'm Representative Mike Sylvester. I'm the House Co-Chair of this committee, and um, I represent District 39, which is the Eastern Peninsula portion of Portland and the Fighting Islands of Casco Bay. I will be keeping the time during the hearings today. Everybody will have three minutes. At the beginning of your testimony, I'm gonna flash my phone at you so you see that it's the timer is working and then at 30 seconds, I'll hold it up so that you can see um, that uh, the time is a ticking. If, uh, if you have your, for folks who are planning on testifying, if you have yourself in gallery mode, that works best so that you can see when that little phone gets up there. Uh, and uh, we thank everybody for being here today. We look forward to a lively day of testimony. Thank you so much. Um, up next, can Senator Heckman, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, thank you, Senator Daughtry. Good morning, everyone. I'm Craig Hickman. I represent State, State Senate District 14, 11 towns in Southern Kennebec County. Um, it has been a joy and an honor to chair this committee for the better part of the last year, also having come in a little bit late to the game. Uh, I really appreciate the staff that helped me transition. Uh, Mr. Langland, you've been great. I know Mr. Purvis is new, he's been great. And my, my former co-chair, Representative Sylvester, certainly um, knows this stuff better than most of us here. And he certainly was um, a great part of the insight for the institutional memory that I needed to get going. Um, I appreciate all of you. I'm glad I'm still here. I would like to also uh, thank Senator Miramont for his work on this committee. We stole him over on VLA, where he's also excited to be. And of course, um, we are in new hands. And so welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. You got full attendance. I don't think we ever got that when I was chair. So there must be something, <laughs> <laughs> something there <laughs> to be said. Noted. No pressure. <laughs> well, up next an introduction, Senator Guerin, if you wouldn't mind. Good morning. I'm Senator Stacy Guerin, and I am happy to welcome Senator Daughtry to our team. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Thank you so much. And then uh, Representative Bradstreet. Uh, thank you and good morning. Welcome to Labor and Housing, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Representative Dick Bradstreet. I represent House District 80, and that's comprised of my hometown of Vassalboro, Windsor, Somerville, and part of Augusta. And I probably will stay on because if I left, it would, it would help uh, uh, the good Senator Hickman from having a full house here. <laughs> Up next, uh, Representative Cuddy, please. Good morning. Welcome, Senator Daughtry, to the committee. We appreciate having you here. And uh, my name is Scott Cuddy. I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville, and I live in Winterport. And Representative Drinkwater. Good morning, and welcome to the Labor Committee. I'm Representative Gary Drinkwater from District 121. And Representative Gear. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Gear. I represent House District 9, which is Kenny Bunkport and Coastal Biddeford and Kenny Bunk. Welcome to Senator Daughtry. Uh, very happy to have you here and, and happy that we still have Senator Hickman with us as well. Thank you. Representative Morris. Good morning. I am Representative Joshua Morris. I represent House District 75, which is the towns of Turner, Leeds, and Livermore. And welcome to the Labor Committee. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pepworth. Good morning. I'm Sarah Pepworth. I represent House District 133 in the Blue Hill Peninsula. That includes Blue Hill, Brooksville, Brooklyn, Castine, Surrey, and Sedgwick. And it's hard to follow all these other welcomes, but we do indeed embrace the changes here at the Labor Committee and um, wish everyone the best success in their new roles. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Prescott. I'm Dwayne Prescott. I represent Waterboro and Lyman. Thank you. And Representative Rader. Welcome, Madam Chair, uh, to the best committee. Uh, my name is Amy Rader. I represent District 125, which is a portion of Bangor. Thank you. And Representative Warren. Good morning and welcome. I'm Representative Sophie Warren and very fortunate to represent part of my hometown here in Scarborough, Maine. Thank you. And we are ably assisted today by our committee clerk at Justin. And please tell me if I'm saying your last name wrong. Is it Purvis? That's correct. Perfect. <laughs> welcome aboard. I'm glad to see you. Thank you so much. And for those who are watching or participating, um, if you're looking for information on the Zoom or any other um, information. Justin is the one who's keeping the ship going forward. Um, so please reach out to him as well. And we are also ably assisted by our OPLA analyst, Stephen Langland. Am I saying that right? Perfect. Well, with that, just a few ground rules before we jump into our first public hearing. As a reminder, everything is being uh, uh, broadcast live, either through audio stream or through YouTube. Please keep this in mind um, for any public testimony. The purpose of today is to solicit comment from bill sponsors as well as members of the public. And uh, one sort of tip and trick we always say in education is keep this in mind. Please don't say anything you wouldn't want to say to your grandmother and have you know preserved in print in perpetuity. Um, with that, uh, we are in our virtual format. So please keep this in mind for folks coming back and forth. There's a little bit of what we like to call the Alice in Wonderland Zoom lag that can happen in between. So please be patient. Please be patient with me in my first day. Uh, really excited, but I'm sure there'll be a little bit of a learning curve. But with that, uh, just real quick on the order of bills thus far, um, we are gonna go LD 1874, LD 1878, LD 1879 and LD 1881. But just a heads up to everyone, the bill sponsor, Representative Dillingham of LD 1881 does have commitments in BLA. So we've said for her that we'll try to be mindful of when she's done to be able to come and testify. So that one bill might get moved around, um, but we'll make sure that everyone is kept apprised of any scheduling changes. With that, before I open the public hearing, anything I've forgotten or any questions from the committee? Representative Sylvester. I just wanted to remind all the folks who are getting ready to, test money, to testify that the chat is to be used for technical purposes only. So not to add commentary or ask questions about the testimony or uh, provide additional testimony. So if you have a question about the orders or that sort of thing, that's the perfect place to, to talk with Justin or one of the chairs, and, uh, um, but not to add, add additional comment. Thank you, important reminder. And with that, Let's kick things off and I'm going to open the public hearing on LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. And we are joined by the bill sponsor, Representative Bruce White. Representative White, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you and congratulations, Senator Daughtry on your new uh, assignment here. Um, so Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester and esteemed members on the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Bruce White and I represent part of Waterville in the House of Representatives. I am here today to present LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. I hope the committee will support this important legislation. Last session, this committee passed LD 993, a bill which was designed to provide up to 15 days of paid leave for school employees impacted by COVID. 
The idea was very simple. We are asking school employees to juggle a tremendous amount of amount right now, and it seems as if every day they are facing new obstacles. Many have faced multiple quarantines, some have gotten COVID, and others made the decision to stay out of school because they had COVID symptoms. Others may have needed to use sick leave because their own child had to quarantine or their childcare facility was closed due to COVID. When I worked on LD993 with this committee, I was concerned educators in our schools were using their own sick time to to remain paid while doing their part to keep our kids as safe as can be. I was quite surprised when I learned that some school districts have had inaccurate interpretations of the bill that is now law. I have learned some school districts have argued LD-993 expired on October 18, 2021, and have since that time denied the provisions of LD-993 to their employees. While section two of LD-993 clearly spells out the application of the new law, some have pointed to other language to make the case the bill was sunsetted. Other educators have told me they have exhausted their own sick leave, so the district required them to go without pay. This just doesn't seem right. The bill before you is an attempt to fix the concerns I have heard from educators in our schools and provides clarity to districts and school employees. LD 1874 will remove any language that allows anyone to argue that the provisions in LD 993 sunsetted on October 18th of 2021. My intent for LD 993 was to make sure school employees had up to 15 days to use for specific COVID-related absences. And LD 1874 will make this intent clear. I have also worked with the analyst for this committee, and I thank him, to prepare the attached amendment. You'll see that in my testimony. This would require school districts to make whole any employee that had no sick leave to use and was therefore required to go without pay. I'd like to emphasize, many school employees have used their own sick leave to cover exposures to COVID while working at school. Some have gotten COVID after school-based exposures. With all we are asking, all our teachers and educators, I believe the least we can and should do is to make sure they have the leave they need would pay to cover COVID-related absences. Some teachers may be pregnant or may encounter serious illness. It would be unfortunate if they used all their sick leave to cover school-based COVID absences, only to find they have no more sick leave to attend to their other needs. Lastly, LD-993 has generated significant concern in the field. I understand some school districts have pending grievances on the matter and district and employee unions are likely to be in in legal battles if we fail to act. I hope we can all agree that we should and can support our state's educators during this extraordinary time making sure they have the lead they need during this time. Like, it seems like one more impactful way for us to support them. I hope you will agree. Thank you for your time and consideration. I will certainly do my best to answer any questions you may have. And there are certainly others that will be testifying today that I expect will have firsthand examples and more background to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative White. Do we have any questions from the committee at this time? Uh, Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
thank you, Representative White, for bringing this bill. Um, and I'm wondering if you can quickly um, I'll notify the, the rest of the committee if you haven't seen it at the bottom of uh, Representative White's testimony, which you can get to off of the committee page, uh, off of with, where his testimony is posted, you'll see the amendment to the bill. Um, it has some changes. I wonder if you could just quickly walk through with us, Representative White, what the change is between the bill text that we had received before. I see that it's highlighted. Thank yes, thank you for that. And um, the basically, it, it is removing any, uh, you know, the dates. And um, do you want are you looking at section two, um, basically the restoration? That's correct. Yeah, the change in the amendment. Right. And there's a summary for the committee. That's right. And it's what it says shall have that leave time restored by the school administrative unit instead of May, a public school employee absent from work due to any reason described in the main revised statutes, and it says the title, prior to the effective date of this act shall have that time compensated for by the school administrative unit. This, um, in the summary, it requires a school administrative unit to restore sick time used by a public school employee. And uh, yeah, so pretty straightforward actually now. All right, thank you, Representative. So pretty much what we, uh, can we have a follow-up, Madam Chair? Thank you. Uh, I think you're about to experience uh, our two dogs singing the song of their people. My apologies, uh, Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative White, for being here this morning. Good to see you. Uh, clarification, uh, this is meant to be uh, paid sick leave rather than paid leave, right? I think I, that's the way I read it in the, uh, in the bill and in the amendment. And also, is this cost to be borne by the local school districts? Well, good question. And, and I'm not sure where you say paid sick leave and paid leave. I mean, it, it's pretty clear in here that it's COVID related. So it's paid leave. Um, and as far as um, <clears throat> it's paid leave, right? Not just sick leave. So it is, you know, related to the COVID for quarantine. If a child has to quarantine, the teacher has to take time off or an employee, not just a teacher, by the way, um, anybody in the schools. And then and your second question was? Uh, uh, is it the local school districts or uh, that will bear the cost of this? Yeah, I would assume that would be the case. And, and just as a no, I mean, you know, well, I'll just leave it at that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Representative Bradstreet. Representative Drinkwater? Thank you, Madam Chair. If the local school units are to bear the cost of, of this, would that be considered an unfunded mandate? That's a great question. I guess your committee would, um, you know, probably have to discuss that when you um, have your work session, I believe. I, I'm not sure on the details of that, but thank you for asking. I will say, though, also that this bill, I failed to mention, when this went before the Senate and the House, after it was, it came out with a divided report, the LD-993, it passed under the hammer in both uh, the Senate and the House. So there was little debate. So I feel there was a great deal of support in the past, and I don't see why there wouldn't be right now to clarify this bill. Thank you, Representative Gear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative White, I'm just looking to clarify the portion of 993 that has led to this confusion. And it seems like, I, just so I'm on the same page, that they're in, in item one in the published law, it says a public school employee who was affected by COVID-19 and used sick leave prior to the effective date of this section. So I'm assuming that the issue there is that if that legislation went into effect, 
on October 18th, there is some interpretation that uh, therefore anything after that would not be covered. Is that is that a correct reading of what's happened here? Yes, it is. And it certainly was not the intent to have it expire. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you, Representative White, for your bill and for your testimony and presentation. Thank you. With that, um, we have Representative Sachs with us. And also, Justin, I got a message from um, Senator Rafferty, who also uh, had signed up to testify. So if we could promote him as well to go after Representative Sachs, it'd be uh, much appreciated. And the floor is yours, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and esteemed colleagues and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Melanie Sachs. I'm honored to represent House District 48, which includes Freeport and part of Pownall. I'm before you today as a co-sponsor and strong supporter of LD 1874. Uh, the school employees in my district are incredible, as I'm sure they are in yours. My own two children went through the RSU 5 public school system and were supported at every level. It is now time to support the school employees of every district here in our wonderful state. I connected with staff, many who wanted to be here, but they are in the classrooms um, in my district to highlight three key reasons why this bill is so important. Number one, it restores needed leave to our essential school employees. Due to language in the previous bill, as Representative White said, overwhelmingly approved by the legislature, leave that was taken by school employees in good faith and adherence to the public safety protocols after October 18th of 2021 has not been restored to employees, or in some cases, employees have been forced to go without pay. LD 1874 provides communities with uniform guidance to retroactively approve leave for COVID-19 related absences before that date and going forward, it provides all school employees with up to 15 days of paid leave to cover any COVID related absences. One teacher told me it felt like the district was not supportive of staff, quote unquote, when leave is denied, when they get quote, given so much to help families and kids during this crisis. Number two, it recognizes the continued need for supportive, supportive policies during an ongoing crisis. One teacher wrote that, quote, our current system of sick time leave was not designed for a global pandemic. In the dark days of 2020, there was a significant amount of grace and many accommodations were made with the understanding that the pandemic was unprecedented and that people would need additional time to care for their family. For those of us with children under five, for example, who are ineligible for vaccines, this is still very much the case, unquote. For young teachers and particular who must quote, save their bank for maternity leave or accommodate disruptions in care and what I put in quotes of a normal year. This is a struggle. If we are to retain and recruit teachers we, and other school staff, we must make sure they're supported by recognizing the unique strain that COVID-19 is having on systems not designed for a pandemic. And finally, number three, it reaffirms the need to provide paid leave for staff to take care not only of themselves, but also of others in the event of a suspected or confirmed positive COVID diagnosis. A third of the teachers responding to a survey at Freeport High School indicated they had to stay home not due to their own exposure, but instead due to an exposure or po positive COVID diagnosis for their own teacher, uh, their own children. Another survey I didn't add in here um, puts those numbers at, at about 30 days um, collectively for folks. This does not include those who had to stay home with children who had a reaction to a vaccine or booster. The majority of those responding indicated they had lost personally four or more days of work. Some of that time was taken prior to vaccines and boosters being available. We need to support school staff as they adhere to these public health guidelines for themselves and their families by enabling them to take needed time. We are all well versed especially this committee, regarding the impact of disruptions in childcare and lack of flexibility has had on many industries leading to exits from the workforce. We do not wanna lose caring and dedicated school staff because we did not put adequate policies in place. They've been incredibly flexible in the face of extraordinary circumstances during this pandemic. They have adapted to remote learning, hybrid models, mask mandates, cleaning protocols, pool testing, all with various levels of acceptance in their communities. They've addressed not only the educational needs, but also the critical emotional support and stability of their students for almost two years. It is time for this legislature to step up and give those employees the support and stability they need and deserve. 
I urge you to unanimously pass a uh, vote ought to pass for LD 1874. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Representative Sachs. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Representative Gear. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Sachs, um, it does appear to me that this is the result of an oversight and a mistake in the way this legislation was drafted. So I just want to make sure that um, I get your perspective on that. Would you agree with that? I would. And um, that's why I went to the teachers in my district and the school staff to say, how is this impacting you with this particular um, interpretation? And, and that's what they came back with. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any further questions? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time, Representative Sachs. We do have one more legislative sponsor, Senator uh, Rafferty, who has texted me to let me know that he is having internet difficulties. And it does appear as if he's still frozen, but gonna give it one, one chance. Senator Rafferty, can you hear me? It's like the education committee is stealing him back through cyberspace. Well, in uh, respect of everyone's time, uh, when Senator Rafferty is able to rejoin us, we will shift to his testimony. But in the meantime, uh, we will have the next folks uh, who are on the schedule. We'll have um, Crystal Ash Cuthbert, and I apologize if I massacre anyone's name, followed by Peter Colesworth, and followed by uh, Jenissa Cataretti. So um, can we promote uh, Crystal? Good morning, Crystal, the floor is yours. And just a reminder, uh, before we switch to testimony from the public, uh, legislative sponsors do have unlimited time, but for members of uh, the public and all else, uh, we have a three minute timer that my good house chair, Representative Sylvester, as he said, will be the keeper of the timer. So with that, the floor is yours. Hi, sorry, um, my voice, I'm home today, actually sick, so. Um, my, um, hello, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester and all the members of the Labor and House Committee. My name is Crystal Ash Cuthbert. I work in the Scarborough School District and I'm here representing 350 of the members. I also um, am honored to serve as their local president. Um, I'm here to testify in support of LD 1874, which is an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. I wanted to share with you today that the Scarborough School District was um, exceptional following all the CDC and DOE guidelines for quarantining and isolation last year and into this year. Um, the reality of teaching, especially at the K to five level, is that teachers are always a close contact. Um, we have yet to figure out how to have kindergartners zip their own jackets um, and <laughs> they still need hugs as much as we try and push them away. Um, but uh, um, the reality of COVID in the classroom is we do the best we can, but we meet the needs of kids, period. Um, and I wanted to share three stories with you today. Um, the first one is a colleague of mine. Her name is Tanya. She works for Scarborough and lives in the town of Scarborough and both of her children go to Scarborough schools. Her youngest was in close contact um, and as part of the Scarborough protocols, uh, he was mandated to quarantine for 10 days. Uh, Tanya, of course, had to stay home and she and her husband shared um, every other day, uh, staying home with him through his 10 days. Um, and even though Scarborough School District mandated that she stay home or that her child um, be home um, because she was staying home due to what the district deemed was child care, uh, she went all of those days without pay. Um, and so that's an example <clears throat> of I, uh, some to go without pay for following the rules that your district and your state have set in place doesn't seem quite fair. Um, and I can name dozens of people who are in the same situation as her in my district. Um, we, a second woman is a member who's new to our staff. Oh, I'm sorry, 
Representative Sylvester, that's my, I have 20 seconds left. You have 25 seconds left. Okay. Um, so um, I'll skip Susan, who is pregnant and out of sick days, and Andrea, whose husband is also an educator and went unpaid. Um, but the legislator passed LD 933 last year for exactly the situations that I've shared today. The intent of that bill was clear then, and the authors of the bill have also publicly confirmed its intent. Our district is quite large. Scarborough is quite large, and many have been impacted. And if Ms. Ash Cuthbert, yes. I, I wonder. I that is your time. I wonder if okay. you could finish your thought and uh, and conclude your testimony. Um, we are one of those districts that, because so many people have been impacted in our district, um, we will be moving forward with um, further um, legal action um, to get those days back. Um, it seems like you're talking about getting sick days back. Um, we have many, many people have gone without pay as a result of, of um, the pandemic. And I believe LD 933 was supposed to cover that. Um, but unfortunately, um, law firms have taken it a different direction. So if you have any questions, I think I'm supposed to ask that next. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ash Cuthbert. Um, and did I say your name correctly? Crystal Ash Cuthbert, yep. Okay. Uh, do I have any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time and I hope your throat, throat rests and you get some uh, time to recover. Um, I do want to switch over to Senator Rafferty who was able to connect to give him um, the time to testify. And then we'll circle back to Peter Colesworth and uh, Janessa Cataretti. Uh, with that, the floor is yours, Senator Rafferty and hello from education. Oh, Senator Rafferty, you are on mute. Unmute. All right. Now we can hear you. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, fortunately, I have a backup here and, and an iPad as a, my computer just crashed. Oh, no. Perfect timing. But uh, Senator Daughtry, good luck to you in your new role. I know for the committee, uh, this is your um, third uh, Senate chair, and I think about the last 10 months. Um, good luck to you all. I know you continue to do great work. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, good morning, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and distinguished members of the Committee on Labor and Housing. It is nice to see you all again, as it's been a while. And as most of you know, my name is Joe Rafferty, and I proudly represent the people uh, in Senate District 34, which includes Acton, Lebanon, North Berwick, Potts of Berwick, Wells, and Kennebunk. I'm here today in support of LD 1874 as it is designed for a school administrative unit to grant up to 15 days of paid leave to public school employees affected by conditions related to COVID-19. These conditions may come in the form of an illness, quarantine, primary caretaker, a parent of a child whose school or place of care was closed or unavailable due to precautions related to COVID. The bill allows a public school employee who use sick time uh, leave prior to the effective date of this legislation be entitled to request that the leave time be restored and that the school comply with the request. COVID has created many unforeseen challenges worldwide. Uh, while dealing with the virus itself, we've also dealt with the fallout it created. Locally, our school employees have been impacted in a variety of ways. Uh, many of you know that occasionally I serve as a substitute here in our community, and I see uh, this firsthand. Um, while the um, <clears throat> fixes and oversights uh, that were have arisen from LD 993, uh, I think this bill provides us an opportunity to correct those. It also uh, allows us to recognize one of the many challenges that the workforce faces particularly as it relates to public school employees. Uh, it's, I, it also gives this committee and fellow legislators a chance to demonstrate that we understand the situation and will provide a fix on your behalf. I thank you for your time and consideration of LD 1874. I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Senator Rafferty. Any questions from the committee? 
seeing them. Thank you for your time. Good luck with the computer. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good day. You too. Up next, we have Peter Colesworth, followed by Genesee Cotteretti. Mr. Colesworth, the floor is yours. Good morning, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and esteemed members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Peter Colesworthy, and I'm a fourth year, seventh grade math and science teacher at Mount Ararat Middle School in Topsom, and I'm here to testify in support of LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. I may look like your average healthy 30-year-old man, but almost five years ago, I developed an autoimmune disorder called granulomatosis with polyangitis. Part of the ongoing management of this aggressive disease is that I spend a day receiving a chemotherapy infusion every three to four months. As a result, my immune system is severely diminished and I get sick very easily. Last school year, I was able to keep myself safe by teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade math remotely, but this year that was not an option. So far, I've contracted COVID-19 twice from my classroom, once in December and, when, and again when we returned in January. Every year we earn 14 sick days and sadly, I end up using just about all of them due to my infusions and higher likelihood of being sick. This year, I've been forced to use 11 of those 14 sick days for quarantines alone, and I'm currently sitting with one sick day left. That sick day is earmarked for my next infusion this coming May. Should I be out for any reason between now and the end of the year, almost five months from now, I will start be to get my pay docked and my per diem rate. Heaven forbid I contract COVID again, I would be out at least five days and $650, a quarter of my monthly income. The pandemic did not end on October 18th. Last week alone, we had 99 staff and students out with COVID, down from 130 the week before. At this point in time, we essentially have an uncontrolled pandemic spreading through our schools and us teachers are getting caught in the crossfire. Clarifying LD993 is the simplest step forward in showing support for us teachers. We have persevered through remote teaching, masking and social distancing, and now the uncontrolled spread of Omicron through our schools. The idea that we would punish those teachers who have showed up and gotten sick as a result has many of us incredibly frustrated. None of us should be facing lost sick days and docked pay as we attempt to create some sense of normalcy for our kids and their families. Thank you for listening to my story and I urge you all to please pass LD 1874 with all due haste. We are suffering now and there are teachers already having their pay docked. If you have any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Colesworth, and thank you for sharing your personal story. I have a question from Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Colesworthy, thank you for your testimony. You mentioned about having to you know, take time off. Were you able to, to use any uh, time out of the uh, sick bank? I'm assuming your school has a sick bank that you could draw upon. Yes, sir. And so I believe I have contributed a day. However, we are not allowed to use any of the days from our sick bank until we've exhausted all of our sick days, personal days, and any other days that we can use before then. Thank you. You're very welcome. Do I have any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Colesworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Up next, I have Genesee Cataretti. And was I saying your first and last name, hopefully correct or close? You did very well. <laughs> you did very well, thank you. <laughs> Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester and esteemed members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Janessa Cataret and I live and work in Kennebunk. I am here to testify in support of LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. As the president of my local, I continue to hear stories from my members about the hardships of juggling self, family, and work during such a tumultuous time. COVID continues to rage around us, and though we would have never considered ourselves frontline workers, that is exactly what we have become. LD993 was a means of providing peace of mind to employees in the event that a single quarantine, or in some cases, multiple quarantines, could not completely deplete an individual's own accrued sick time. Unfortunately, the law as written has been left to interpretation and the hard deadline of October 18th means many have lost sick days that would otherwise have been protected. 
One of our employees was recently denied these paid days as a result of our district refusing to implement LD 993 past October 18th. She had to make a difficult decision whether to stay home with her young children, ages three and five, in quarantine and take away from her own sick leave, which is certainly not as robust as seasoned employees, or find alternative childcare options. What is even more frustrating is that this individual had never utilized COVID sick leave in the past, yet when the time came, it was unavailable to her without any regard or concern. This situation, though seemingly insignificant to our administration, is just another layer of added stress at a time when mental health is crumbling rapidly. As educators, we have answered the call of duty over and over again. We have pivoted, risked our own health and well being, and continue to provide a safe and stable environment to the children in our care. At the very least, our school districts can make their employees whole by following the language of the bill and allowing all to use up to 15 days of leave due to any COVID related absences. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. I have a question from Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've heard previous testimony that legal challenges and grievances are being filed because the school refused to acknowledge the, the uh, LD 993. Is your school currently doing the same thing? We have not filed a grievance yet. Um, we are kind of waiting to see where things play out, but we would have a number of grievances to file based on the misinterpretation of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies, we have the mailman or something outside. The joys of being at doggy daycare. Um, up next, uh, thank you so much for your time today. I do believe that we have Chelsea, and I'm going to go on mute, and Chelsea, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and other members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Chelsea Secutis. I live in Portland, and I'm a teacher in RSU 5 the school district that serves Freeport, Durham, and Pownall. I'm here to testify in support of LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. This legislation impacts my family in a myriad of ways. First, I have a one-year-old son. Like virtually everyone with small children, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on my family. I apologize. It sounds like we're having an announcement here at school. <laughs> um, uh, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on my family and our ability to balance work and childcare. While vaccines and masks have significantly reduced necessary quarantine requirements for much of the population, children under two are ineligible for vaccines and unable to regularly wear masks. As a result, they are still subject to a 10 day quarantine, not only when they have COVID, but also anytime they merely come in close contact with someone who has tested positive. My son has already had to complete two 10 day quarantines from daycare. And unfortunately with the prevalence of Omicron, we anticipate having to do this at least once or twice before the end of the school year. He's actually getting a PCR test today. My husband is also a teacher. And while we have both accrued a significant amount of sick time during our tenure as public school educators, the pace at which we are using our sick leave to stay home and care for our son will quickly deplete the time we have saved up. We are in between 12 and 15 new sick days per year, which in normal times would be more than enough. But with multiple 10 day quarantines in a year, we will quickly reach the limits of our sick time. In addition to needing sick time to care for my son when he is in quarantine from daycare, my husband and I are also overjoyed to be expecting our second child. As a teacher, the only way I'm able to be paid for my maternity leave is to accrue sick time from previous years and use that time to continue to receive pay while on leave. I currently have just about exactly the number of sick days that I will need to cover my maternity leave. And so any subsequent sick days of leave I take this year will mean that next year I will either need to take a portion of my maternity leave unpaid or I will have to cut my maternity leave short. Finally, the last point that I would like to make is that in addition to the fact that our leave is inadequate to support childcare needs during the pandemic, we are also at a significantly higher risk of exposure because of the fact that we are educators. My husband and I are both vaccinated, boosted, and regularly wear masks and take significant precautions in our personal lives, but our family has well over 100 possible close contacts a day because of the fact that we are working with the public. My husband and I strongly support in-person learning and we accept this additional risk because we believe it is what is best for our students. 
However, this increased exposure means that we are at a higher likelihood for additional COVID-19 quarantines, which would further drain our sick time. Our current system of sick leave was not designed for a global pandemic. In 2020, accommodations were made with the understanding that, that the pandemic was unprecedented and that people would need to take additional time to care for their families. Particularly with those of us with children under five who are ineligible for vaccines, this is still very much the case. I strongly urge you to support LD 1874 and act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees so that educators across the state are able to care for their families without losing pay. Are there any questions? Thank you so much and apologies for the uh, cacophony at <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Up next, I have Chris Coleman followed by Jason Curry. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, Senator Daughtry, <clears throat> Representative Sylvester and other members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Christopher Coleman. Uh, I'm a resident of Nobleboro and work at the Great Salt Bay Community School in Damascata as a third grade teacher. I'm in my 12th year of teaching and in 2017 I was recognized as the Lincoln County Teacher of the Year. I'm here to testify in support of LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. I appear, you, I appear before you today slightly embarrassed that I belong to one of the school districts in Maine that took some bad advice and decided to exploit a very fuzzy loophole in LD 993. Claiming the provisions of that bill sunset on October 18th, 2021. On October, 8, October 18th was on a Monday. I'm not sure, but there was probably a beautiful sunset over Pemaquid Pond where I walked my dog on that day. I'm absolutely certain though, that come Tuesday morning, the sun rose again and the COVID-19 pandemic was still raging throughout our state and in our communities. I still wore a mask all day, both indoors and out. I still spent my day reminding eight-year-olds to pull up their masks, wash and sanitize their hands and stay six feet apart. And I still spent many of my lunch breaks and prep periods listening to my colleagues, often through tears, lament about the fact that they just can't do this anymore. The sun may have set on October 18th, but nothing changed in school the following day. I have a colleague with twin boys, both third graders at our school. Back in November, both boys were sent home as close contacts because they rode the bus with a student who tested positive for COVID-19. She submitted a request for emergency paid leave and quickly received an email from our principal letting her know that our school had chosen to no longer honor LD 90, 993 as it was written. When I spoke with her about it, I could tell she was scared. We both knew this was probably not the last time she would need to stay home with the boys and watch her sick leave diminish. For some newer teachers who haven't accrued much sick leave, this scenario repeated just a few times would result in that individual needing to take unpaid leave, a financial hardship no teacher can afford. And let us not forget, this leave is being taken for COVID related reasons. Neither the previously mentioned teacher or her boys were sick, not even a sniffle. They were just following the rules and recommendations handed down to us from the main CDC and the Department of Education with the sole purpose of keeping our students in school and preventing the spread of COVID-19. In a letter written on September 16th, 2021, Senator Hickman, Representative White, and Representative Sylvester wrote a letter to superintendents and school board members in Maine public schools in reference to a misinterpretation of LD 993. The final paragraph sums up my feelings on this issue. They wrote, we remain saddened such a bill is even needed. We would encourage school districts to do the right thing and make sure our educators can follow basic public safety recommendations without jeopardizing the financial stability of their families. While I'm grateful to be here speaking in favor of LD 1874, I too am saddened that such a bill is even needed. I'm saddened that many districts chose not to do the right thing, sending a clear message to teachers. They chose to have, save a buck on the backs of their teachers. So now the ball is back in your court and I have full confidence that the distinguished members of this committee and the 130th Maine Legislature will close this fictitious loophole and just do the right thing. This bill is about safety. This bill is about compassion. This bill is about gratitude. And in the spirit of gratitude, I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Coleman. Do I have any questions from the committee? Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Coleman, obviously your school uh, you know, has issues with it. Do you know if any legal challenges or grievances have been filed through uh, your collective bargaining agreement? Uh, we have not done that yet. Thank you. Do I have any other questions? Representative Gear. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, I'm curious, Mr. Coleman, are you familiar with any of the uh, legal guidance that has been given to school districts on this matter? Uh, I am not. I just know that <clears throat> um, they perhaps were advised um, that it's sunset on October 18th, LD uh, 993. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gear, and thank you, Mr. Coleman. And I think that's a good notification for our analysts to see if we can um, get information on those questions for our work session as well. Um, with that, uh, up next, we have Jason Curry. The floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and the esteemed legislators who are members of the Labor Committee. I very much appreciate your time. And fascinatingly, I'll just say Peter Colesworthy, a previous education speaker, was one of my students here at MS 8051, which is the towns of Cumberland and North Yarmouth. Uh, I've been here for 24 years as a social studies teacher and debate coach. There's one salient fact that I think I would like to bring to the members of the committee that I don't believe has been mentioned yet. And that is that we, Maine, and even the United States, did not experience Omicron until mid-November, and it started hitting really in December. This bill apparently sunsetted before Omicron even hit us, and we know that Omicron is much more contagious, although the severity of it is under question. It's much more contagious, and to lose the ability to have these days after October 18th or 19th is devastating in many cases. Uh, to, to answer a question that I would anticipate, I'd say that my school district, MSAD 51, has decided after uh, November, I believe the decision was made in mid-December, to still offer the 15 days going forward as well as backward from that date. So my local association of which I'm president has not considered any kind of legal action. I would like to mention that several of the members of my association have asked me whether they should come to school with COVID symptoms because they can't afford to take days off because their own children have had their schools in red days and they had to stay home for their children. Our schools were in red days and they had to use days to be paid like ed techs and secretaries. Um, and they may have been sick themselves and their children may have been sick themselves. And so we've experienced cases where people have asked the association, should I still come to school sick because I can't afford to not be there? And that terrifies me. That terrifies me for the well being of my fellow staff. And it terrifies me for the well being of my students. I would like to quote a member of my association who sent me testimony to offer the committee, Megan Holden, who's been here in our district several years. She's an instructional strategist. And she was informed on October 31st that her eight year old daughter uh, had to stay at home and she needed to use five days of COVID sick time for that. She then had to use several days of COVID sick time because her school went remote and then because her daughter's school went remote and she has no time left. And our district is offering to move forward with it. We appreciate that. We think every district in the state should, and we know you have the power to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Curry, for your testimony. I have questions from Representative Drinkwater followed by Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Curry, I'm assuming you work for the Greeley school, school system over there. Fantastic I school system. You. My grandsons attended that school. Nice. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, just adding up the numbers that you talked about this one uh, teacher having to use 12 days. And, and, and this bill only talks about 15 days. Are we not giving enough days for some of these people? I wouldn't possibly dare to tell the committee or the legislature that we need more. Uh, I think in personal circumstances, some educators may need more. Uh, and in that case, you've referred to the sick bank before. Uh, I know I've donated to the sick bank every year that I've been here. But uh, again, as a previous educator has said, they take personal days, they take other days, they take vacation days, uh, and then they'll take from the sick bank. 
Well, I guess what my point is that, you know, we talk about unintended consequences a lot. Uh, obviously, unintended consequences, as some schools are interpreting that it's sunsetted on October 18th. Could an unintended consequence be, hey, you know what? We're not out of this pandemic yet. Perhaps 15 days aren't enough. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Drinkwater. Representative Sylvester, please. Jason, Mr. Curry, uh, great to Hi. see you again. Good to as see you. A, as a former debate coach uh, who was heartened to, uh, to see that uh, it happened on, on Zoom uh, or on the internet anyway, as if, you know, because debate is a close contact sport. Um, I assume you just won the debate with your district uh, or, or, or was there a process through which, uh, you know, you might enlighten the committee that uh, that discussion happened and you ended up in a happy place? Well, I know that my vice president and I advocated pretty strongly with our administrators. Uh, I believe also our administrators, independent of our coaxing, uh, were starting to see the negative effects on our school district, on staff morale, uh, and their consciences dictated to them that they listen to the association and that they move forward in a humane way. Thank you, sir, and thank you for all your work. Thank you. Do I have any more questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time today. Up next, I have Amber Jones followed by Jason Knight. Amber Jones, can you hear us or are you able to join us at this time? Yes, thank you. Perfect, we can hear you, we just can't see you. Let's see. Perfect. Good. Senator Dodd, Representative Sylvester and other members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Amber Jones and I live and work in the town of Waldeboro and I'm here to testify in support of LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and the employees at Miller, Miller Elementary in the RC 40 district. I worked throughout the entirety of the COVID-19 pandemic. I worked from home, connecting with students through a screen, many of them high risk and or with disabilities. I managed to continue working at school while my own children were at home all day due to the pandemic. I masked, I shielded, I took all precautions necessary to prevent contracting COVID and to protect the children with who I came in contact with. Despite these efforts, I became a close contact and was required to quarantine due to state and CDC guidelines. Shockingly, I discovered that mandated quarantine time was at my expense. Thankfully, I had sufficient amount of days to cover the required time off and ensure a full paycheck. If required to quarantine again, I would not. The potential to become a close contact and or contract COVID at school is great. Omicron is quickly spreading regardless of, <clears throat> excuse me, regardless of vaccination or prior COVID illness. BHPs in my district <clears throat> earn 10 days of personal time, minus one day some of us automatically give to the sick bank. That leaves nine days, nine days to cover 10 days of quarantine in some cases, and with the new guidelines, at least five, which is still more uh, than half of the days we earn in a year. Nine days to cover an unknown amount of possible quarantine and COVID days. For hourly employees, when personal days are gone, required time off is left unpaid. My family budget depends on my full paycheck every other week. The addition of financial burdens during an already stressful time in the midst of a pandemic is daunting. The possibility of quarantining or contracting COVID has now created a feeling of apprehension, a sense of uncertainty and insecurity. District recommendation is to stay home if you or your school-aged children aren't feeling well, when truthfully, that's easier said than done when there are few or no sick days left. This decision, especially in a pandemic, should never be difficult. 15 days of relief is a small step towards helping mitigate the stress and burden of potential quarantine and COVID and is a great start in alleviating the hardship that is COVID-19. 15 days of relief would take an immense amount of pressure away from the people at the heart of education. 15 days of relief lets us know that you appreciate and understand the risk we take simply by coming to work every day. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? 
Seeing none, thank you so much. Up next, we have Jason Knight. Uh, hello, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, esteemed members of the Labor and Housing Committee. I am here today uh, to testify uh, in support of LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. Ironically, I'm coming to you uh, today from home with cold or COVID-like symptoms. Uh, once this is done, I'll be going to look for a, a COVID test. Um, I am a parent of two students in Auburn, Maine, and I work for Mount Ararat Middle School and a science teacher, seventh and eighth grade. I had a prepared um, letter that has been addressed much more eloquently by previous speakers. I'm going to diverge a little from that. One of my roles at the middle school and with my district is as the grievance chair for our teachers association. Many teachers have come to me this year with questions around LD 993, and I wanted to speak to the fact that disproportionately it is new teachers, uh, it is new parents, uh, questions around the number of sick days that we get and access to sick bank have come up. In my building, we have 20 new hires this year on a staff of 100. 20% of the staff in my school cannot access the sick bank until February. They don't have the option of accessing the sick bank until February. These 20% of our staff are starting off with only the 15 sick days we get by contract. It's their first year. They don't have an accumulation like I do of 18 years of sick days. Staying home today with a cold, what I hope is a cold was an easy choice for me. One woman that I teach with uh, was hired mid-year as one teacher had resigned. And her first day of school was notified that her young child was a close contact and needed to quarantine. This person's first day of work was to find out that she had to use, I believe it was seven of her sick days. Um, this additional leave is not a thing that teachers want. Um, we, we want to be in our classrooms with our kids. As anyone who has ever worked in a classroom knows, being absent is far more work than it is to be present in the classroom. Preparing a lesson that a substitute can deliver if we can find a substitute, um, and then reteaching that lesson as needed when we come back is far more work. We don't want this leave time, we need it. We need it because of the extraordinary situation we are in and the impact it is having on all of our aspects uh, of our lives and our families. And I, I see that I'm out of time. I would welcome any questions. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mr. Knight. I have a question from Representative Prescott. Well, thank you. I've been looking at LD 993 and I see the amendment H333 passed. Uh, in that amendment, it doesn't sunset. It just says that you get 15 days due to COVID relief. So I've heard several people mention that this is a sunset. Uh, so what you're really asking for is 15 extra days due to COVID every year. Is that right? Because there is no sunset under the amendment that passed. Um, I haven't, I, I don't have the words of that amendment in front of me. Um, my interpretation of it was that it was uh, a 15 day addition. Uh, I, I did not read it. Let me restate. I'm a science teacher, not a lawyer. Uh, I did not read it, uh, that it was a 15, 15 days per year. That's not how I read it. Um, well, well, it doesn't say per year, it just says 15 days due to COVID, which gives the assumption it's on top of all the sick leave that you've built up. But there, you know, again, I've heard a lot of people talk about a sunset, which is what the new bill is proposing to take out, but I don't see it in the amendment. So, and I, I completely understand that you didn't get all the nooks and crannies of that. I had to read through it several times myself. So anybody coming up, if they would like to, you know, exploit on this, that would be nice. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Representative Prescott. And I think that's another good flag for our OPLA analysts to make sure that we really drill down and make sure we have a clear clarification on exactly uh, that. Thank you. Um, Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Knight, uh, just to follow on uh, Representative Prescott's um, question and, and you know, having talked to dozens of teachers who asked me this same exact question, um, this, these the 15 additional days that, that uh, 933 built into the, the schedule, none of those teachers saw a sunset in that bill either, right? It was a legal interpretation uh, from lawyers who were advising uh, school systems uh, that that came from. Is, is that correct uh, from your understanding? That's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Do I have any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Knight, and fingers crossed that it's just a cold. Um, up next, we have Jay Rich. Hello, good morning, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and other members of the Labor and Housing Committee. Thank you for your service to our great state of Maine, and also thank you, thank you for taking the time to be here this morning. My name is Jay Rich. I am the interim president for the Lewiston Education Association, as well as an ELL teacher in, the, in Lewiston. Um, I'm speaking today in favor of LD 1874, an act to clarify COVID-19 paid leave for school employees. Um, the 2021-2022 school year had not been, has not been the rebuilding year many of us have hoped it to be. Instead, we've seen COVID-19 cases break record after record, and Lewiston has pushed to keep students in schools five days a week while juggling staffing and busing shortages. This has caused teachers and students to place themselves in situations where they are exposed to COVID-19 multiple times a day. I want to take this time to give you a couple of anecdotes about people this bill would impact. First, I want to tell you about an ed tech in our district. Towards the end of October, this educator was initially placed on a 10-day quarantine. They used their personal days and it left them with zero by the end of their quarantine. And then on day nine, their child became a close contact, giving them an additional days, 10 days of quarantine, they had to stay home. Um, there were other situations that came up where their other child then tested positive and it ended up that this educator is out for five weeks without pay. Now, this bill would not cover that entire time of paid of, of leave, but can you imagine being out that long from work and not having this financial stability? Um, just think of the stress on top of having a very sick child. Next, one of my own colleagues is unable to be fully vaccinated due to a pre-existing medical condition. This individual has taken all precautions, including wearing two masks at school, socially distancing, and also not going out into the community to restaurants or grocery stores to limit their risk of exposure. This educator contracted COVID-19 from school in November, and they too have to use, had to use their sick time when they were out of school. After returning for a few weeks, they had to leave again on, uh, now on medical leave due to long-term COVID effects. These are just two examples of the hundreds of teachers who have been financially impacted by COVID. Last year, if a teacher felt ill or suspected that they may have COVID, they were encouraged to stay home and felt comforted by the fact that their sick days were not being taken and that they would be paid for the, paid for the day. Now that this is a completely different story, many of our educators are dealing with long-term COVID effects, including extreme exhaustion and labored breathing. They are coming into school sick because they cannot afford to stay home. I am in favor of the bill to provide an additional 15 days of COVID leave for our educators. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, I think the next one that we have in favor is John Kaczynski. Welcome, Mr. Hello. Good Good morning, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and other esteemed members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is John Kaczynski. I'm here on behalf of the Maine Education Association. We represent 24,000 educators in the state, including educators in nearly every public school in the state. Um, I just wanna say I provided written testimony for you 
The number of folks who contacted me about this bill, I'm confident if this hearing were after school today, we would have several hours of testimony from educators around the state who are extremely frustrated by the interpretations that have been made about the previous bill and frankly are asking for your help. I hope we can all agree the efforts of our educators in this state over the past two years have been heroic. Bus drivers, ed techs, teachers, school employees, they have put their own personal health and safety at risk to provide in-person learning to students all over the state. You heard teachers today zooming in from their classrooms. You heard teachers who are sick, who thought it was important enough to be here and convey the stories that they are hearing from other teachers. There are, districts had a choice here. And some of them, like RSU 51, did the right thing. I want to give a shout out to Tim Doak, who is the superintendent in RSU 39, Caribou, in SAD 20 in Fort Fairfield, who heard the arguments of the attorneys and said, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to implement LD 993 as it was intended to be, to make sure people have some lead to get through this challenging time. And sadly, there are those districts who went through the arguments who said there may be some gray areas here, and that's the places where we're going to have unfortunate disputes about paid sick leave provisions, about paid leave provisions, rather than focusing on the needs of students during a pandemic of providing in-person learning. I just want to highlight, you've heard the stories, I do want to highlight just a few that just reiterate the issues that have been raised by some school board attorneys regarding LD993. Number one, whether or not the bill sunset October 18th. That is clear. And they have, in some districts, have, writ, have, have raised the issue that this expired on October 18th. So October 19th, it, no, these 15 days do not apply. The second issue has been around restoration. They point to the term restoration. And they have told employees, you had no sick leave. Even prior to October 18th, you had no sick leave, so there's nothing for us to restore. LD 1874 will correct both of those and avoid the disputes locally. I just want to say it's no secret that we are seeing significant workforce shortages in education, ed techs, teachers. Please do the right thing. This is no way to treat a heroic workforce. We need help. Educators need help. This is one simple bill that I hope there'll be bipartisan support to stand with educators and say, we hear you and we're trying to help. Thank you for your time and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, I have a question from Representative Bradstreet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kaczynski for being with us again. I'm kind Good of curious you. as to why different, different districts interpret it differently. Is there no definitive uh, direction from anybody from the Department of Education or anywhere on this uh, explaining in clarity what the uh, original bill calls for? Um, it's a great question, sir. And I think I just sort of articulated districts were given advice by attorneys who raised issues about LD 993. And then it became a decision locally whether or not you wanted to listen to those arguments that made arguments that there were gray areas of the law, or you could do the right thing. And th some districts did the right thing and implemented LD 993 as intended. And I think in some of these places, I heard Representative Drinkwater ask some folks, well, are there grievances? I think a lot of people are waiting for to see what happens here. There are grievances piling up around the state. There's no question about that. This has been in too many districts where they didn't do the right thing, that this has been an ongoing dispute. So you can solve all this, you can fix all this. We could have the Department of Ed write something or you know, the governor's office could write something. I don't know if it's gonna change the dynamic in the field without clarity brought about by this law. I hope that helps, sir. Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Kaczynski. Um, just, just to remind the committee, there is one law firm that represents most of the district in the state that most school districts and school boards have on retainer. 
Uh, and so this wasn't 80 different lawyers coming to some legal consensus no. that this was how the law was written. This, this was by and large one, uh, uh, you know, one firm uh, deciding that this is the way that they wish to interpret the law. Is, is that fair? That's exactly correct, sir. That is exactly correct. And I am certain, you know, sadly, there's been a pattern here of is almost a cottage industry now who seem to take the new laws and try to find ways to make arguments about the new laws. And sadly, this is one of those examples. Thank you very much. Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Kaczynski, good to see you again. As always, you bring entertainment to your testimony. Uh, As you find it entertaining, I was actually heartfelt, I hope, today. Absolutely. Uh, did the, do you, are you aware that if the Department of Education sent out a memo to all the schools to explain what they are interpreting the uh, uh, 993? Sir, I'm sorry, I don't recall there. I don't get all of their notifications, um, but I don't recall seeing anything to that effect. Are you aware of one? Uh, no, I, I am. Uh, I am not. Haven't heard anything. And, and just a quick follow up, if I may. Uh, did uh, did Drummond and Woodson send out a legal opinion to all the school districts? And if so, did you happen to get a copy of it? I, that's a great question, sir. I did not get a copy of it. I don't recall getting a copy of it. But what we saw was this all happened around the state at the same time. So when we see that, we usually know, OK, there's been a communication from Drummond Woodson in some form or fashion that has conveyed this because it usually happens in rapid succession around the states. And leaders like the ones you heard today will contact us saying, LD993, our district saying it's sunset. And we're getting that from this district and that district and that district. So we can usually connect the dots back. There have been some um, superintendents who have shared with us that the advice did come from Drummond Woodson. I could check. There might be someone on my staff who has gotten access to that, but I personally have not, sir. Uh, if you do have it, I would like to see that for the workshop. Thank you, sir. See what I can do. I have Senator Guerin next. Thank you, Senator Doctor. Um, my, I have a couple questions. Um, do you know for sure that there were no other legal opinions opinions on this, it was only that one law firm, or is that just something you're speculating on? I'm speculating, Senator Guerin. I would say, as Representative Sylvester said, there's one law firm in the state that probably represents 80% of the school districts, maybe even higher than that, and they tend to drive the discussion around legal issues in our school districts. Okay, but that other 20% certainly could have gotten other opinions that were the same. And Senator Gary, I want to be clear, it could, they could represent 95% of school districts. So I'm being conservative in my guess, but um, it, it could be, there could be other attorneys who have a similar opinion. Okay, um, Senator Daughtry, another question? Rick, go right ahead. I'm wondering if you think that in putting this under paid leave instead of sick leave, is that going to change union contracts at all? I don't believe so. I mean, I think the in talking with the sponsor and seeing the problems that were created around the state, there were places um, where they were saying, well, you don't have any more sick leave, so we don't have to restore anything, and therefore you have to go unpaid. The number of loopholes that the other side was looking for in 993, I think made the sponsor just be a little bit more broad and to say paid instead of sick. That's how I remember the conversation with the sponsor of this bill. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily any additional collective bargaining obligations be changing it from sick to paid. In, the, in your interpretation, the paid would only be for COVID-related absences. Oh, that's clear in the bill and the amendment, Senator. It says these items, either COVID, COVID symptoms, quarantine, child care facility closed, they're spelled out clearly. These 15 days are, I don't think that's in dispute. I think what's in dispute is, did the bill sunset on October 18th? And um, be, above and beyond that, if you don't have sick days, should you go unpaid, even if uh, you know, you, you've run out before? Okay. And- Senator Daughtry, <laughs> at your pleasure, one more question. Of course. 
this is the most conversation we've ever had, Senator Garrett. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, in looking at this law, and, and, and Mr. Langlin, I'd like to have you look at it too as analyst. Would you say that this is only 15 days total for the entire duration of COVID. It is an additional 15 days for 2022. It's a 15 day total all time. The per, do you want me to answer, Senator? Yes. Okay, the, our understanding or interpretation with 15 days for every school employee beginning January 1st, 2021 until they have used those 15 days. So whether okay. they've used total, so if you used all 15 days, January 2nd to January, whatever, your 15 days, that is your 15 days from this bill. If you used your 15 days, October 19th until whenever, it's still covered under the 15 days. It was one time, 15 days. It sounds like some members of the committee, want, maybe Representative Drinkwater, want to go further and make it 30. We would support that entirely because you've heard the stories from the field about how people are struggling in this environment. So. If there's an effort to increase this, I'm sure educators in the state will applaud even more than before. Perhaps they would, but I doubt the private sector workers that don't get 15 days would support that. But thank you. And I'm, I'm done with my line of questioning, Senator Thank Doctor. you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Guerin. Next, I have Representative Warren followed by Representative Gear. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you very much for your testimony. I um, I think a big issue for me, I know at least in my community, is getting kids in, in school and how important that is for the main children and um, wanting to make sure that they're safe as well and wanting to make sure that everyone is, you know, treated well and respected and um, getting what they deserve. But, you know, I think, um, I guess my, my issue here is, and, and I'm wondering if you could comment on this, is regardless of where the legal opinion is coming from, I may be, maybe that is a little bit, at least for me, inside baseball, I'm, I'm, I'm in my first turn here. Regardless of where the advice is coming from, you know, some advice is it's respected a lot more than other advice, um, maybe, you know, as it should be. And so uh, for whatever reason, it does seem that quite a few uh, influential individuals have made a set of decisions within our school districts um, to do or not do uh, something in accordance with the spirit of this law as written versus not. And so it seems like there has been quite a bit of decisions made based on this law, regardless if it came from one firm giving that opinion with all due respect. Um, so my feeling is if if the amount of um, districts and, and impact to teachers is such that it seems like this could be a concern to keeping teacher healthy teachers in schools, in classrooms and figuring out a way through this pandemic of getting kids back in school where you know, they belong and where we all want to see them, uh, but see them healthy. And so um, I'm just wondering, could you just speak to the, in the real world impacts that both, there's been quite a few, probably very well-meaning, wanting to do what's right, um, uh, school districts who have made a decision um, that this law is, as written, is, uh, is one way. And that maybe if we want to <laughs> try and get through this pandemic, that maybe we, we got to make that amendment for that reason. So again, if you could speak to how many uh, well-meaning decision makers in Maine have made a certain set of decisions based on how this law is written and why it might be important, again, um, if you could restate, uh, why it's important to make that amendment, what the impact could be. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Representative Warren. I think I understand your question. I don't have the specific number who have done the right thing. I will tell you, even before this law, there were districts who were doing the right thing. Even before LD993 was printed, there were school districts who were responding to COVID and making sure educators had the leave they needed so they could follow the basic health and safety protocols, as you heard today from teachers around the state, who are saying we were just following guidelines. And in those, there were districts that did the right thing and said, we're going to take care of you. We're going to provide a sick leave bank. We're going to. And then there was LD993. And then even after that, there were districts who said, we hear the legal arguments. We're going to go ahead and do the right thing and make sure our, our folks here have the 15 days. And I just want to underscore, and I think this is along your point, Representative Warren, you had teachers today appearing before you sick because this was critical that they 
have their voices heard on this critical bill. Teachers zooming in from their classroom. They are telling you this is an important bill. And again, if this were at 245 today, this public hearing, we would have hours of testimony of teachers telling you why this is important and what they're seeing in their district. When you're dealing with a workforce that is burnt out from the past two years and is struggling and we're losing people, it would be better if school districts were doing the right thing and taking care of employees during this time. It would be better for the schools. It would be better for the students. It would be better for all of us if districts were doing that. Sadly, that's not the case. And this bill would hopefully get us back on that track. So we avoid disputes about the interpretation of LG 993 and instead get focused on doing the best job our schools can do and trying to get people through a very challenging time in their professional careers. Did that help Representative Warren? Was that a long? Yeah, no, I think asking? it does for the most part. If I could ask a brief clarifying uh, question. Thank you very much. Uh, just that my my point was more that I think a reasonable interpretation could see that uh, could could see it the way that um, we're saying during this hearing, quote unquote, um, those who are not doing the right thing. Uh, I, I think there's many districts who reasonably are like, you know, we we've, we've only got so much money, so many resources in this difficult time, you know. So so I, I feel that though, if we want to get through this pandemic, the 15 days, as I'm hearing it, I think a reasonable person could say that's the way it ought to be. That was the spirit of the law. But it's not the way it was written, or at least many, many school districts, it seems like, have interpreted it that way. Regardless if all that interpretation came at the advice of one law firm, it does seem that quite a few decision makers in Maine have, have reasonably uh, made that determination. But uh, it sounds from your testimony that um, it's it's actually, it, 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 uh, it could be argued that it's, it's very good to have these 15 days and that we ought to maybe make that correction for that reason, because we want to keep kids in school. We want to keep teachers healthy. So that that being kind of getting through the weeds or the inside baseball here, that it seems like for whatever reason, a lot of reasonable people, decision makers in Maine, have interpreted the law thusly, whether it's right or wrong. And um, in order to kind of get past this confusion and get through this pandemic, um, I think that's sort of what we're talking about here, not the inside baseball of this one big law firm, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's both, Representative Warren. I think it's definitely about how we treat our school employees who have been heroic during this time. I think that, and in plenty of places where we have great collaboration between administration and, and educators, they have been able to work this out. I do need to flag, or at least say, the attorneys who produce these opinions will be the same ones who get hired to litigate the arguments. So it's not as if this happens in a vacuum. The attorneys who are saying, well, there might be a gray area here and there might be the gray area there will be the same ones who are in the arbitrations deciding whether or not the law is gray. So I just need to point that out. And we can, and, and LD 1874, hopefully, none of that will be necessary. Thank you. I have Representative Gear. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, nice to see you, Mr. Kaczynski. Uh, two things I wanted to ask. One is I, I, find my, I find myself sitting here this morning remembering when we were discussing uh, LD 993 and how I think many of us felt that we were kind of getting through COVID and making progress and getting to the other side of it. And I think that obviously what's happened over the last several months is Delta and Omicron have, have thrown us all a major, major curveball and send, sent us into territory that I don't think anybody was really uh, foreseeing or had any um, real, uh, you know, it just it was a horrible thing to, nobody was thinking about where we would be right now. So I guess two things I would ask. One is, do you see LD 1874 as the key way that we would have to remedy uh, the situation given the turn of events that we've seen happen? And then secondly, I'll just flag this for the analyst uh, with regard to school districts and how they're dealing with this, this situation as well. Um, if there is COVID money available that we could look at in the budget to help districts to fund this ongoing cost that's gonna need to be covered to, I don't think there's anybody here questioning that honestly, um, that's gonna need to be covered to 
keep teachers uh, whole when it comes to their sick leave. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Gear. Um, I will just say, I, I believe LD 1874 is a key remedy. I will say, and I was sort of jokingly saying this when Senator Guerin was asking questions, there are some teachers who are saying, or educators who think 15 days is not enough. I went through 15 days in January and now I'm down to zero. You did hear testimony today from someone who I was hoping would be here who is pregnant and I believe due tomorrow and now has no more sick leave. Um, because of the number of quarantines that this person, I know you heard somebody else who was pregnant. It was another person, another um, educator who wanted to appear. So um, I am worried. LD 1874 fixes 993 and hopefully makes a little bit of progress and makes people feel a little bit better that when the legislature passes a law, we're going to stand behind it and do the right thing and make sure it gets implemented for educators. I think that's why this bill is so critical. In terms of going forward, I, I can't speak specifically about COVID money. I know each district has gotten different um, allotments, both from the state and from the feds. They have, um, this has certainly been the most uh, generous funding of public schools we have ever seen, including 55% for the first time in state's history from the state. So thank you for that, all the legislators for that. Um, I think there's a real question around the cost of this as well, because frankly, a sick leave day for an educator who would have otherwise been paid the only additional cost, there is no additional cost if someone already has a sick day. It's an additional liability perhaps on the spreadsheet of a district, but the cost remains the same, which is the cost of the substitute. So I think there's a question about that that I'm happy to dig in more. I know we've had a lot of discussion today, but I, I, the cost question, I think, is minimal at best um, because of the it really whether or not a teacher is in the classroom or not, the cost of the district is typically the same, which is the cost of a substitute. Thank you. And if I could, Senator Dodger, if we, we could just I just would like to have some analysis about the cost picture, because, again, I think it's just fundamentally different than what we were thinking about last year in terms of how this would evolve. So thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Gear. Do I have any other questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, Mr. Kaczynski, thank you for your time this morning. I see that the Labor and Housing Committee likes to uh, put you through the ringer as much as the Education Committee. So thanks for being here. Um, before we move on to testimony um, in opposition, is there anyone present left in the participants room who has not been called who is intending to testify in favor? If you are, please raise your hand um, with the reaction feature in the waiting room and we will move you in. Going once, going twice, okay, not seeing anyone. We are gonna be moving on to those in opposition. Up first, I have Stephen Bailey and it feels like I just got to bring most of the education committee and world in to welcome me in for my first day in labor. So with that, Mr. Bailey, the floor is yours. Good morning and welcome uh, Senator Daughtry and also uh, welcome to uh, Representative Sylvester as well as members of the Labor and Housing Committee. Good to see you all again. And yes, we, we've heard some interesting uh, conversation and uh, documentation uh, earlier already this morning. Um, I am Stephen Bailey. I'm Executive Director of the Maine School Management Association. I'm here today to testify in behalf, on behalf of the legislative committees of the Maine School Superintendents Association as well as the Maine School Boards Association. We are in opposition of 1874 as we were for LD 993 uh, because we do feel it's unnecessary. Well, some of you may feel uh, differently about that. Uh, we do appreciate the intent as well as the importance of providing uh, time for uh, staff uh, to make sure that they are, are well when they're actually in school, as well as uh, uh, making sure that they're available so that we can maintain the maximum amount of time for our students to be uh, present in person in school. Um, I can't speak uh, to some of the individual circumstances, some of which uh, that have been uh, mentioned today, uh, but we will speak of some things that we know that are happening. Administrators are working with their unions to adopt mem memorandums of agreement and COVID specific leave policies to address needs for additional sick leave during the pandemic. 
these negotiations and agreements are best done at the local level, we think. We have attached samples of those agreements from Gardner-based MSAD 11, South Portland, Portland, RSU 23 of Old Orchard Beach, and School Union 93 encompassing Blue Hill, Castine, and Surrey. So you see there's geographic representation and two different uh, districts were mentioned earlier today, MSAD 51, as well as um, RSU 39 and also MSAD 20 uh, up in the county. South Portland, for example, allows up to 80 hours of COVID-related pay with the option of petitioning the superintendent for five additional days. That agreement runs from August 25th, 2021 to June 25th, 2022. Old Orchard, RSU 23, established a paid leave bank for all employees not working remotely that is separate from existing sick banks where eligible employees are allowed up to 10 paid days from the bank when they cannot work due to the coronavirus. A similar policy was adopted in Blue Hill. School districts have and will continue to work with the teachers and staff to safely keep schools open because students already have lost too much instructional time. Masking and vaccinations are our greatest and most effective preventions, and they are working. Our understanding for the Department of Education and the CDC is schools are some of the safest places to be and are not contributing to virus spread. We don't believe that passing statewide rules around COVID leave is appropriate or necessary. Districts are adopting them where they are needed. A mandate for this passed down by the legislature just doesn't work. The Labor and Housing Committee and the legislature should respect the role of school boards and the residents and property taxpayers who support public education and not pass LD 1874. Um, as you consider the amendment, I, Mr. I do Mr. Bailey. Have that, yes. that, is, that is the end of your time. I wonder if you could finish up your thoughts. I do have a question as it relates to the uh, amendment. Um, and it's the part that has, um, for the effective date of this act, shall have the time compensated for the school administrative district. And as uh, Mr. Kaczynski was just, just speaking earlier, um, the sick leave itself is time that would be reinstated. I don't know what the, the cost uh, would be. And if there is a cost, it would seem like there would be a fiscal note also attached uh, to this particular bill. So if that could be considered perhaps uh, during the work session conversation or by the analyst. We can have that um, looked at as well. Do we have any questions from the committee at this time for Mr. Bailey? I have uh, Representative Sylvester followed by Representative Pepworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just I'll note that uh, my dog Sweets is the one snoring loudly in the background. It isn't uh, that I've fallen asleep during this hearing. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here, Mr. Bailey. Um, I noted uh, when looking at the folks uh, who were here today uh, that we don't see any municipalities coming in to testify against this bill. We don't see any um, principals. We don't see any school board members. In fact, the Principals Association uh, test wrote, put written testimony in favor of this bill, although they had some, some questions about where they would find the substitutes. Um, and so I wondered, uh, since we've been discussing sort of where this legal interpretation came from, whether Maine School Management uh, had been privy to that uh, discussion of, of the loophole in, in terms of their, this being sunsetted uh, from that interpretation, whether or not you'd been, it could give us any insight into that. Uh, certainly. And uh, yes, we were privy to that because we had questions from districts who were calling us to say, you know, what's what's the intent of this? It looks like uh, this bill has a certain length of time for that. And so we were asked, you know, can you find out for us as a collective group uh, information about this bill? So, yes, we sought information about LD993, uh, looking at uh, both of the length of it as well as the intent of it. Uh, it, it did seem to be a bill where districts were concerned about the financial implications uh, that it would have on their, on their districts. So being responsive to not only staff, but also to uh, the residents, uh, taxpayers, uh, they, were, they were concerned about how this was going to you know, continue uh, to go forward. So as a, re as a result of that, and as we've talked about already, many of the districts did look at, are there other funds that might be available? And uh, in terms of the COVID relief funds, uh, that may have been a source at that particular point in time that could have been used. And it is uh, a, a fund that could continue to be uh, explored to see if it could be utilized. 
uh, but districts went ahead and uh, made plans with their associations to be able to provide additional time outside the, the, the law. Quick follow up, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, that answer. I think uh, having negotiated a bunch of contracts, I know it's, there's often the language and the intent uh, when Senator Hickman and, and the sponsors of 923 put out our letter uh, to folks, we scoured our notes looking for any conversation about a sunset of this bill, whether it was contemplated in any of the hearings or any of the, you know, and, and the several discussions that I had uh, with the sponsor and you know, about amendments and, and found nothing uh, that we, that the committee intended this to sunset. And so I wondered uh, where you found that intent. I don't know whether there was an intent. I, it was the way that I certainly read uh, section one of, of that particular bill when it was, was when it was passed. And uh, yes, it was my own interpretation in terms of uh, from what, what the uh, effective date of, prior to the effective date of the legislation. Uh, in terms of how this particular amendment has been offered, if, if, this, if this is there as um, Representative Aguirre has suggested that this is a clarification and a, a rewrite of what the intent was, then, then perhaps you know, that was the, the, the better language that might have been used at that particular point in time. Um, I, I do think, you know, schools were, were, were looking at it in terms of, you know, how long is this effective? You know, where, where does this uh, start and where does it end? Thank you. I have Representative Prescott followed by Representative Bradstreet. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think some of my question might have just been answered, but I'm looking at the LD 1874 as compared to LD 993, and it's pretty much the same thing. There is no sunset clause in either one of these bills, by the way. What this new bill is gonna do is say, if you used up any sick time due to COVID previous to January, 2021, you're gonna get reimbursed for those. And that's really what this bill does. And I think Mr. Bailey had hit upon that. So I really don't have a question. <laughs> so thank you very much. No worries, Representative. I have Representative Bradstreet and I just wanted to confirm, uh, Representative Pebworth, did I skip over you? You're good, okay. Representative Bradstreet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Bailey for being here once again. I, again. You already answered a couple of questions that I have, but I also have one other one. I think it was alluded to earlier by someone. The amendment uh, uh, at the bottom of the page, one of the amendment, it, uh, it strikes out sick leave and puts in paid leave. In your opinion, is there any substantive difference between the two and the way the bill will eventually be interpreted? I would have to explore that one as well. And yes, we saw this, uh, you know, as it came in on Friday, um, uh, the, the, the paid leave portion of that as it relates to also time that shall uh, have that shall have that time compensated. You know, that's that's, uh, you know, the major question that I have in terms of how the two might might uh, interact with one another. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from the committee at this time? Going once, going twice. Uh, with that, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Bailey. Thank you for my time with you. Um, if there's anyone in the participants in the waiting room who had intended to testify against this bill, um, please use the raise hand fe feature at this point so we can bring you in. Not seeing any, um, is there anyone here? We have no one signed up, I just wanna make sure. Um, is there anyone here who would like to testify neither for nor against? Okay, not seeing anyone. Uh, before we close the public hearing, any questions from the committee that you'd like to make sure that the um, analyst is able or anyone who's listening able to get us materials? I have Representative Drinkwater. Yes. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, for the analysis, we're hearing obviously different opinions on was it sunsetted, was it not? I think Opla could answer that question for us on the original intent of 993. And that would be my concern. Thank you. And then Representative Pebworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am curious what happens if I am an employee 
and I am subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19 numerous times and therefore use up those 15 days. We'll look into that and see what we can find out. Any other questions for analysts on this? Okay, seeing no further questions from the committee and no further testimony, I will close the public hearing on LD 1874. For those listening, um, we unfortunately, uh, Representative Dillingham did have to run to present a different bill. So we will be switching over to 18, um, LD 1878. So with that, open the work session on LD 1878, an act to support restaurants in the state through service charge revenues. And Representative Sheehan of Biddeford will be uh, presenting it as the bill's prime sponsor. If we can um, promote her into the hearing. This is when you need like wait music sort of going on with the Zoom or something. Could you repeat um, who we're bringing in again? I apologize, I missed that. No worries. Uh, Representative Aaron Sheehan is the bill's sponsor. Representative Sheehan should be coming through. Perfect. Representative, the floor is yours whenever you're able to join us. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. And uh, welcome to the Labor and Housing Committee. Congrats on your appointment to this awesome committee. And good morning to Representative Sylvester too, um, and the other esteemed members of Labor and Housing. I'm Erin Sheehan. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm proud to represent Biddeford's House District 12. I'm pleased to come to you today to present LD 1878, an act to support restaurants in the state through service charge revenues. As restaurants across Maine began to reopen after the initial shutdowns of 2020, I noticed some operators beginning to collect service charges. They're typically calculated as a percentage of the check total, and they do not represent gratuity. In the wake of the shutdowns, the cost of goods and labor were skyrocketing, and as the public was still reluctant to dine inside, many restaurants were purchasing outdoor dining furniture and other safety equipment. Service charges seemed to me to offer a reasonable option for certain restaurants to stay afloat, to keep their workers employed, and to advance pay equity in their businesses during these difficult times. However, while Maine statute explicitly allows banquets and private clubs to collect service charges, the statute makes no reference whatsoever to restaurants. This silence creates a legal gray area for restaurant operators who must appeal to the current interpretation offered by the Department of Labor. As recently as 2017, the Department of Labor interpreted the statutory silence as a prohibition on service charge collection in restaurants. The DOL's interpretation may have shifted in recent years and many operators would like to incorporate service charges into their revenue models, but their lawyers caution that the statutory gray area could expose them to liability in the future. Restaurant operators should be able to reference clear statute when creating or amending their business models. They should not have to operate subject to shifting departmental interpretations. Maine is a true outlier in this regard. Advocates all the way from hospitality Maine to one fair wage have advised me that Maine might be the only state that has barred service charges for restaurants. And both groups agree that they are a crucial tool for restaurants. When conceiving the bill, I looked for a way to ensure that service charges would benefit restaurant workers, encouraging better working conditions and or compensation. Initially, I drafted the bill to require restaurant operators to apply service charge revenues towards some form of direct employee compensation for example, as wages or toward healthcare or retirement plans. Through the Legislative Council appeal process, I eliminated that requirement, but introduced the requirement that restaurants forego the tip credit in order to collect service charges. Some of those who will testify seem to be under the impression that the bill eliminates the tip credit, but this is not the case. 
I will admit that there are benefits and drawbacks to both versions. While the current version provides an incentive for restaurants to move away from the subminimum wage for tipped workers, which is a goal that I support, it also runs the risk of exacerbating disparities in compensation within restaurants, where kitchen workers typically walk with $18 to $22 an hour, while their tipped coworkers can walk with anywhere from $30 to as much as $100 an hour. And yes, even in Maine, these disparities are racialized. I'll say bluntly that the bill as drafted needs amendment if it is to help our restaurants improve the lives who work in them of those who work in them and create clean, clear statute. For example, the statute distinguishes between restaurants and banquets, but some restaurants operate as banquet halls when they offer private events for a package cost. Hospitality Maine has prepared some language to ensure statu statutory clarity around these types of operations. Restaurants across Maine are still struggling in the wake of pandemic related revenue losses. The rebound has been slow and uneven and operating expenses are through the roof with supply chain issues and the higher wages required to attract and retain a shrinking pool of workers. Service charges represent a modest yet meaningful tool that could help restaurants keep their lights on, maintain the jobs they've created and pay their workers at the rates demanded by current labor market conditions. We need to clarify the statute so restaurants can respond confidently to the unprecedented challenges they are facing today. Committee members, I greatly appreciate any questions you can bring to this hearing and would like to suggest that you direct any technical questions about statute, statutory definitions, and tax law to your committee analyst or to those who may follow my testimony. I'm happy to do my best to answer any other questions you may have, and I thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you so much, Representative. Do you have any questions from the committee? Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Sheehan, for bringing this bill and uh, for your testimony. Um, in our conversations, one of the goals of this bill is to help restaurants have the resources to be able to hire staff. Is that correct? I mean, that's one of the major, um, you know, crises right now in the hospitality industry is being able to find staff and, and to sort of have a different way to provide revenue to, to be able to hire staff at the higher wages that are being offered right now. Is that correct? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's anecdotal for me, but I've had many, many conversations um, with folks who have been working in restaurants for, you know, many years. Um, and even decades. And although they they would like to return to restaurant work, they're finding it difficult to um, to afford it, especially when they uh, they need more child care. Um, their kids are are staying out of school um, for quarantine reasons and the like. So that's definitely um, I think that's the most important reason for me sponsoring this bill. Thank you so much and for all your work. Cheers. Do I have Representative Pepworth next? Hello, Representative Sheehan. Nice to see you here. I um, have a quick question, which is, um, how do you see the employer notifying the customer that the service charge does not represent a tip for service employees? Thanks so much for that question, Representative. Um, under current statute, um, banquet halls and private clubs who who collect service charges are required to to notify the customer that the service charge does not represent a gratuity um, and this can be done in a number of ways um, typically if you visit a restaurant that is collecting service charges when you get your check uh, the service charge will appear on the check um, on a separate line from gratuity. Um, and most of the operators that I have seen um, are specifying on that line item what they will be, uh, like what the service charge is for. So some people are calling it a 3% wellness charge. Some people specify that they're collecting service charges to help compensate their kitchen workers. Um, but it is required um, 
under the current statute for banquet halls and private clubs, and it would um, it would be required um, under this bill as well. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you, Representative, for bringing this forward and for being with us this morning. Thank you all. Up next, we have Senator Heather Sanborn joining us. Senator Sanborn, welcome, and the floor is yours. Good morning, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. I am Senator Heather Sanborn, and I represent Senate District 28, which is part of Portland and part of Westbrook. I'm before you today as a co-sponsor of the bill. It would clarify Maine's law regarding non-tip service charges that may be charged by restaurants. Current Maine law explicitly allows service charges to be added to bills in a catering setting, but the law is silent as to whether restaurants are permitted to add non-tip service charges as well. This leaves many restaurants operating in a gray area. We should give them clarity instead and offer both the certainty and the flexibility that restaurants need, particularly as they enter their third year of struggling with the effects of COVID-19. As all of you know, COVID-19 has caused hospitality businesses all over the state to pivot their operations and quite frankly, to just get more creative in their operations. These pivots diff are different, look different for each business. With regard to non-tip service charges, restaurants have used them in a variety of ways. One local restaurant added a 3% charge to each bill, which was well explained on their menu and put all of the money from that charge to fund health insurance for their employees, something they had never offered before. Another local restaurant added a small non-tip sur surcharge and used those funds entirely to increase the compensation for their kitchen staff, who often makes 10 to $20 an hour less than the tipped service they worked with. COVID-19 caused changes in my own business as well. We now operate a restaurant with a full kitchen, a rising tide. We also have a full in-house catering program to support our private events program. When operating as a caterer, we're able to include a, a catering service charge on the catering bill, which we pay to our kitchen staff and the event team. Our bartenders during the event also receive direct tips on the bar tab from the host or from the guests if they're paying directly. The ability to share the service charges with our kitchen team makes perfect sense and helps to make their compensation much more equitable with the bartenders. We would like to explain, expand the concept if it were clear that we could use uh, such non-tip service charges on our restaurant tabs. The result would be an increase in pay for our whole staff. Thank you for listening to my testimony. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Senator Sanborn. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for, oh, Representative Sylvester. I'm usually not this chatty, uh, but uh, today I have a lot of questions and I knew that Senator Sanborn would be a great person to ask this question from. Um, if you could clarify for us uh, in your interpretation of the bill, the way that in its present form, owners would still not be able to benefit directly in order, to, they wouldn't be able to take, would they be able to take tips out of the service charge or would they be able to use it for other purposes? So to be clear, um as it's written, the service charge is not a tip. So this is like a different conversation we could have about getting rid of tips minimum wage. Um, but the issue here is um, that this would be a service charge um, as opposed to a gratuity. Um, and at least as it would be used and is used in a lot of catering um, operations, um, tips and service charge are expected. Um, so the service charge gets added automatically and then tips are given on top of that and distributed in the usual tipped manner. Um, so this is an opportunity um, to get creative um, and different restaurants are going to use the funds uh, from the service charge in different ways. So as I mentioned, one of the restaurants that I'm familiar with calls it a health and wellness fee and then explains on their menu that 100% of the revenue from that um, let's call it earmarked revenue as opposed to a tip because it's not a tip. Their servers are also still getting 25% tips. They, they're working in downtown Portland. 
Um, but uh, it, that 3% health and wellness charge goes to an earmarked fund that is used 100% um, to defray the cost of their employee health benefits, which they had never offered before. Um, so I suppose, Representative Sylvester, you could say that goes to the owners. Well, it doesn't, right? But it certainly goes and pays a bill that the owners are paying on behalf of their employees and offering a benefit um, that those employees um, didn't have prior to this service charge being implemented at some point over the last couple of years. See, I knew you would be a perfect person to explain it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the committee at this time? Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Sanborn, I think I heard you say that some restaurants are already doing this. So if this bill is needed because it needs to be codified in law, but some restaurants are already doing it, why do we need this bill? Yeah, thank you for that question, Representative Drinkwater. And Representative Sheehan and I went back and forth and round and round on that very question a number of times. And the real reason is because um, it's a gray area. And so depending on how much risk as an employer you're willing to take on, depending on who your attorney is and what they tell you is the right answer here, um, or depending on when you call the Department of Labor, my understanding is you might've gotten a different answer five years ago than you would get if you called today, um, you might get a varying interpretation because the law is silent with regard to service charges for restaurants, but is explicit with regard to service charges for caterers. And so my understanding is that there was an opinion issued at some time in the past that that meant that um, restaurants were prohibited from charging service charges, but that other attorneys could look at that and say, well, no, you can generally charge anything you want unless it's explicitly prohibited in statute. So it, it, we shouldn't read too much into the fact that catering charges, uh, caterers are allowed to charge these service chargers, charges. And I will also note that um, as, as Representative Sheehan said, it's unique in the entire country that a restaurant would not be permitted to sort of put whatever disclosure they wanted on the menu and charge whatever service charge they wanted to, um, and to be clear that those are not tips, and then to encourage tipping on top of that, uh, that's not tip theft, um, as long as it's clearly disclosed that it is a, um, a service charge, um, and it could be separate uh, from, from any kind of tipping compensation. So we need clarity. I think that's the real answer. We need this bill because we need clarity as a restaurant. Um, and mine has chosen not to implement any of these service charges until we get that clarity, except in our catering operation. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Up next, I have Representative Prescott, followed by Representative Cuddy, followed by Senator Guerin. Well, thank you. Hello, Senator. Uh, just some clarity. So restaurants that also operate as a hall can already do this, and just the restaurants that are straight up a restaurant can't. And that's what this bill intends to clear up? I think that um, it's, a, it's a really good question, Representative Prescott. My understanding is that a restaurant, when operating as a caterer, could do this today. Um, so when we are operating our private event space as a private event space, we could do this. Um, but when we're operating just open to the public, serving each table as they come, it's a gray area. Um, right. And it's not clear if we could do it or not. And, and I would just add that you'll hear testimony, I think, from Hospitality Maine with an amendment to make clear that restaurants that also operate as caterers can continue to use this um, without eliminating the, um, the tip credit. Um, and I think that's a very important distinction if we go through uh, with this particular version of the bill, which requires restaurants to um, eliminate the tip credit in order to take advantage of the service charge. Um, which I think has some drawbacks, but if you go forward with that version of it, please make sure that catering operations remain protected so that we can continue to have our tipped employees um, getting the benefit of all of those tips and also a service charge for our kitchen um, in our catering operations because that's working very, very well for catering operations right now. All right, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Up next, I have Representative Cuddy followed by Senator Guerin. 
Thank you, Senator Daughtry, and thank you, Senator Sanborn, for being here uh, to address this bill today. And it sounds to me uh, from your answer to Representative Drinkwater's question as though if we were to pass this bill, we would increase clarity and increase uh, options for small business owners, but we would decrease work for lawyers. Does that seem right? <laughs> I think that's a fair assessment, Representative Cuddy, and a good reason to pass this bill. I have Senator Guerin next. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my question for you is, is this um, surcharge only going to be allowed to you to be used for additional benefits on top of what employees are already getting, or can it be used for the owner to buy tables for outdoor seating and to backfill some of the losses that they've experienced since COVID? Senator Guerin, as written, the current version of the bill that's been proposed by Representative Sheehan has no restriction on how service charge um, could be used as long as it's clearly disclosed that it's not a gratuity. Um, but the way the bill is written, um, in order for a restaurant to utilize service charges, they would have to not utilize the tip credit for any of their employees. Um, I think there is a strong argument to be made for us to take that provision away um, and instead allow for, as we're doing in our catering operation, some ability to double dip and have both service charges, which might go toward whatever uh, additional needs like compensating kitchen um, might be in place and then also have tips in place for those frontline workers um, who are actually serving uh, the food and beverage. Um, and I think that would be a good option for an amendment to the bill, um, but it's not the text before you. The text of the bill before you would allow um, owners to use it to backfill, you know, tables, chairs from the from buying outdoor seating, whatever it might be. Um, but they would have to forego the tip credit uh, for all of their employees in order to be able to start collecting it. So, are you advocating for the removal of the tip credit section of this bill? Um, I think that makes it cleaner. There's no tip credit section um, in the catering provision of the bill. Um, and I think it allows for more flexibility and more creativity for business owners to approach things in different ways. I know that I, for one, am very unlikely to ever eliminate uh, the tip credit in my business um, because it would increase the disparity in in earnings to such an enormous degree uh, between my front of house and back of house if I had to pay Portland minimum wage um, and then the um, sometimes upwards of $30 an hour in tips um, that my employees um, that are serving get. Um, so we pay a lot more than the Portland's uh, um, tipped minimum wage, um, but we don't pay all the way to the Portland minimum wage. And if we did that, it would just it would just bump those servers up so much in terms of their um, earnings that it would it would be um, just more disparity between their their earnings and those of my brewery production workers and my kitchen workers with whom I don't and can't share the tips. Thank you. I have Representative Prescott next. Well, uh, hello again. The hello again. <laughs> The version I'm looking at is very short. Can you point me out the section where it talks about eliminating the tip credit to implement this? Because I don't see it. Um, I don't have it in front of me, Representative Prescott, but I'm sure that your analyst can help you with that during the work session. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much, Senator Sanborn. Up next, let me just pull up our list of testimony. Um, we will now be taking those speaking in favor of this bill. Um, I have Justin St. Louis. We don't have Justin St. Louis here unless he is under another name. If you are under another name, Justin, could you raise your hand? Going once, going twice. Okay, who else do we have here in favor of this bill? Justin, if you wouldn't mind. I see um, Steve DeMillo, are you here to speak in favor? 
Sir DeMillo actually uh, uh, contacted me and he's against. Um, he had just did that by mistake. I think we are all through with our four. Okay. Um, that being said, if there is anyone in the waiting room who had intended on testifying in favor, please use the raise hand feature. Otherwise, we will move on to those in opposition. Seeing no one raising their hand, we will now move on to those wishing to testify in opposition. Um, first off, trying to pull these alphabetically really quickly in my head, um, we have uh, Michelle Corey. Um, also, um, Michelle, we have you down for both neither for nor against as well as against. So if you could please clarify which of the two you intended on testifying. And do we have Michelle? There we go. The floor is yours. Michelle, can you hear us? Yes, sorry. No worries. And we can't see you. I want to clarify okay. for both uh, neither for nor against as well as against. So if you could just clarify which one you intended on uh, testifying on. Well, I am against officially as it is written. So, I mean, I think this will show you how confusing this whole topic is. Um, I thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Senator Daugh Daughtry and uh, Representative Sylvester and uh, Representative Sheehan and Sanborn for putting this forth. I'm 100% for a service charge. I think it's absolutely necessary. But as it is written now, I think there is a big problem. I think, you know, I too am testifying today in hopes that we can get some clarity and that the intent of the bill is as it was intended, so to speak. Um, I want to make sure tip credit doesn't go away. I don't want to have to make the choice, the difficult choice between tip credit and service charge. Um, I think uh, Representative Sanborn was very eloquent in, in explaining, you know, I, I think we need to be able to use both. And we are the only state that is, and I've worked as a server in California under a service charge, which worked very well. And I'm sure most people know in countries around the world, they use a service charge. Um, but we, they generally don't have to choose between one or the other. And the way this bill is written right now, if we use a, a service charge at all, we will not be able to use uh, the tip credit. And, and that's a big problem. Um, I think, you know, there are in California, they, they are use the, excuse me, they have the ability to use like a 3% surcharge, which is essentially a service charge under the definition. And they use it for specific things like health benefits or 401k but we wouldn't be able to do that and still have tip credit. So, you know, I think it would be detrimental ultimately to workers. Um, I think this bill is great. I think we need some creative models to help us uh, with costs and with COVID. I mean, I've been doing business in Portland for 20 years. This is the worst January I've ever seen by far. And it was frankly the worst August I've ever had. Um, we're just dealing with so many costs, so many COVID issues, uh, staff shortages. Um, I, I pay my staff uh, $2 more than, the, than I'm required to. Um, I pay my kitchen a lot and I'm happy to do so, but I don't know how long that's sustainable in, in this climate. Um, and I just you know want the understanding of people that don't work in this business. The idea of a service charge started um, with the idea that we're protecting servers because ultimately when you have a function or a large table and they voluntarily tip, if they don't tip enough, your servers lose out their entire income for that day or, or potentially that week. So we want to be able to protect our servers. We want to be able to pay our servers more. We Thank you, <laughs> Representative Spencer. We want to be able to pay our kitchen more. Um, so I just urge you to look at the language, ultimately. I, I think this bill could be great. I think the service charge is great. I think if you look at the testimony for, we're all saying the same thing. I just think the language needs to be looked. The devil's in the details. The language needs to be looked at very closely so we don't have unintended consequences. Thank you. So, do you have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony and thanks for being with us. Um, thank you very much. Just checking with the uh, list for the testimony that we have, I do believe um, Steve DeMillo would be next again, uh, again. So please, Justin, let me know if I've skipped anyone. 
And if we can promote Steve there, I see he's with us and the floor is yours. Good morning, thank you. Uh, thank you to Representative Sylvester, Senator Daughtry and the committee, and then also to uh, um, Representative uh, Sheehan, and of course, uh, Senator Sanborn for, for this uh, discussion. Um, although I, and I'm sorry that I had signed up for the, that I was supporting it, but because I do support a service charge in the restaurant. So although I support a service charge in a restaurant, I am opposed to LD 17, excuse me, 1878 as written. I was hoping this legislation would clear up the confusion between how the Mills administration interprets the existing service charge language versus how it is defined by, how it was defined by the LePage administration. Um, I hope to see changes that would allow us to add service charges to guest checks in our restaurant, but not, but not at the expense of losing the tip credit. Eliminating the tip credit would increase wages for the highest earners in a restaurant, the tip staff. So these employees regularly earn between 25 and $60 an hour. They're commissioned salespeople. Paying them a higher wage prevents an operator from allotting more payroll dollars to our back of the house staff. Now, does that make any sense? This legislation gives me, gives with one hand and takes with the other as it's written. One of the most common reasons a restaurant would apply a service charge would be to pay our back of the house staff a higher wage, but losing the tip credit wouldn't make that economically feasible. I calculated the dollar amount that we would receive if we added a three and a half percent service charge. And then I calculated the increase in payroll expense based on uh, tip staff being paid the full minimum wage. The increased payroll expense would be higher than the service charges collected. I use three and a half percent because uh, it is a relatively modest amount. It would probably be accepted by most diners, especially if they were informed that the extra charge was going to uh, directly uh, going to directly to our hardworking staff. Uh, service charges are important to an operator, but so is the tip credit. The two should not be linked. Pair these issues with experience with the experiencing uh, skyrocketing food, energy and labor costs and it's a recipe for disaster for our business. All we're really looking for is to add the word restaurants to the existing language. And I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself, Steve Demello. I represent my family. Demello is on the water. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Demello. Do we have any questions from the committee at this time? Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Mr. Demello. Um, I just had a question. We I appreciated uh, Senator Sanborn letting us know she was paying a little above. Is Mr. Demello still here? Oh, there you are. There you, are. you moved to the middle of my screen. I lost you there. All right, perfect. Brady so, Bunker. Um, so I was just curious. Uh, I know that if, you know, there's a law passed federally, if you're paying the what your state's minimum wage is that you can share with the back of the house. I was curious, are you, you don't need to give exact numbers, but are you paying in the Portland area above uh, the tip credit wage and somewhere between that and the, and the full wage? Yeah, thank you, Representative Sylvester. Uh, we do for some of our tip staff, for instance, our wait staff. So folks that wait on table, uh, customers at tables, they are paid the um, half the minimum wage. But our uh, bartenders, our service bartenders, and our bussers uh, are paid at least $2 more an hour than the wait staff. And it's about kind of the the income that they receive, it's different than if you're waiting on tables. It's not as much, not as lucrative. So in trying to keep people uh, working for us in this market, very competitive market, we pay them a higher wage. So hopefully that answers your question. It, it does indeed. Quick follow-up, Madam Chair. Yes. So um, I'm just curious from, you know, because I, I know your operation pretty well. And, I, and so I'm curious, if, would you... I've been trying to get money to the back of the house for six years now and figure out a way to do that. So I'm wondering, is that how you would use it is, is to go to those lower wage uh, front staff and to the back of the house, the lower wage back of the house staff? We, if, we would representative Sylvester, if we were to institute one in it, and it's not totally uh, uh, embraced by some of my other family members. Some think that, you know, like 
my son came back from a restaurant recently downtown from dinner. We always share our dinner experiences, of course. Uh, and he came back and he showed us the receipt and said, uh, you know, three uh, percent surcharge uh, was added to uh, to pay our staff for higher wages. And one of my brothers said, I'd, I'd rather just increase our prices and stay away from that uh, controversy. They they a guest might think, why should I have to pay more money just so you can pay your people? So anyways, that not, that might not matter to anybody else. So, but for a lot of the operators, and I, I listened to Michelle Corey's testimony, that service charge would be helpful. And um, and I and I, I certainly can. See it's a valuable tool to help pay pay the back of the house staff more money. And um, the other thing I was going to mention was that uh, there was some talk, and it hasn't been at this meeting, but the, the the service charges wouldn't be used for that. Absolutely. A service charge, if implemented at all my family's restaurant, would be used to uh, pay the staff more money. Appreciate that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you for your time this morning, Mr. DeMillo. Up next, uh, trying to do the alphabet in my head very quickly. I do believe uh, against next, we have Greg Dougal followed by Jim Mitchell. And Mr. Dougal, the floor is yours. Senator Daughtry, congratulations on your appointment and Representative Sylvester and members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Greg Dougal and I'm here today on behalf of Hospitality Maine speaking in opposition to LD 1878. We greatly appreciate the efforts of Representative Sheehan to bring forward a potential fix for the service charge definition issue, which has dogged us for years. But we also believe the price to pay for this is too great in this proposal loss of the tip credit in that environment. You've also seen the stories in the printed media about legal concerns, as you've heard, for using a service charge or surcharge in a restaurant setting in Maine. So there is a documented need for a fix here. But again, hopefully not at the price of this proposed legislation. The conflict has arisen because of two different interpretations of this language. And it isn't just the fact that restaurants aren't listed as uh, one that can affect, I mean, that can use this. It also says in minimum wage language, tips that are automatically included in the customer's bill or that are charged to a credit card must be treated like tips given to the service employees. Tips cannot be automatically given. Tips are something that people leave voluntarily. Service charges are things that are added. This is true in both federal and state law. However, this line is equally as bad as the fact that, th that the statute is silent on restaurants. Um, the whole point of this legislation is to clear up ambigu ambiguities that exist in current law, but this could create additional questions that may result in more confusion. What if a restaurant owner has banquet rooms and charges a service charge in those banquet facilities? Would she lose the tip credit in a restaurant setting? But we don't support the specifics of this leg legislation. We do appreciate and support the amendment that I thought was going to be put forth by the sponsor, uh, but it is not. And I'm not sure that I want to bring it up now. But, uh, you know, we could say in a restaurant setting, because currently it says a restaurant employer. So a restaurant employer would no longer uh, be able to, if they used, used a service or surcharge, would no longer to be, be able to uh, you know, to take the tip credit. But if it was in a restaurant setting that it said a restaurant employer, then it would be two separate settings. One that would be restaurant, one that would be banquets. Um, our, our suggestion for a fix, we don't, we don't necessarily support that, you know, totally support uh, this uh, amendment to support the bill, but we do think it's a suggestion. Another suggestion would be to somehow incorporate the federal definition of service charges in Maine statute, which I provided in my testimony. And another fix, as I mentioned, could be adding the word restaurant to the current definition. Uh, and uh, we do understand that using the service charge under this model will be a choice for the restaurant, it will be a hard one to make. It will require a double digit service charge or surcharge percentage to be able to pay the difference between the tipped wage and full minimum wage and provide some much needed funding for back of the house employees has been, has been said, which is what restaurateurs are trying to accomplish. HM members that have taken this risk have encountered resistance at 10 to 12% from both tipped employees as they receive less in tips uh, and they because the customers believe the amount to be too much. The sweet spot seems to be 3%, like Steve said, um, but that would not work for, the math would not work for this proposal. And really, I think I'm up out of time, so I will 
stop and thank you, Representative Sylvester, for keeping me on track. Thank you so much, Mr. Dougal. And I do want to highlight the bill sponsor, um, I do think said that, you know, he's open to amendments and discussion of what you just mentioned as well. So just want to make sure that um, that's out there. And with that, I have questions from Senator Guerin and Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, Mr. Dougal. I wondered if you could share any knowledge you have on the tip credit, how, how that appears in statute as related to this bill. Yes, thank you, Senator Guerin. Um, I, as I mentioned in kind of threw into my testimony, which wasn't in there originally, um, that the line that says tips that are automatically included in the customer's bill or that are charged to a credit card must be treated like tips is equally as bad of a situation that we face as not having the word restaurant in the service charge language. Um, and so I think getting the restaurant word back into the, the statute uh, or into the statute would be very helpful. Um, but I also think that that line remaining in statute would cause conflict maybe moving forward. Um, but I, I'm not going to pretend to be a labor lawyer. Uh, that's something that would have to be decided by somebody else. Um, but I did want to address that. And I also, to, to Representative Sylvester's question about um, tip pooling is what he was referring to uh, at the federal level. Uh, the state of Maine does not allow for tips to be given to anyone but service employees. Uh, Representative Fecto at the time, Speaker Fecto, when he worked on the minimum wage bill, added a, a variety of different lines that actually only allow for tips to be shared amongst customarily tipped employees. Um, so even though if at the federal level, if you try to pay the full minimum wage, you're not, I mean, you can, if you pay the full minimum wage, uh, you're all set uh, to do whatever you want with it. That does not apply here in the state of Maine. Thank you, Senator Guerin. Hopefully that worked. Do you have a follow up, Senator Guerin? Your hand's still up. Oh, okay, I'm going to move on to. I am notorious for leaving my hand up. Feel free to always take it down when I'm asking my question, Senator Daughtry. No worries, <laughs> Senator. Uh, Representative Bradstreet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good to see you, Mr. Dougal. <clears throat> So uh, to recap, there's something somewhere out there in the universe, there's language that would make this bill, if not, pal uh, if not what you're looking for, then at least palatable. Um, the, the two things that we are for are you somehow using the federal definition of a service charge, which may or may not be something that this group would like to do. Um, the other item would be just to add under current service charge language, it says a bank, an employer in a banquet or private club setting. It would be great to say an employer in a restaurant banquet or private club setting. Those are the two things that we would like to see. But knowing that the language it was what the language was and what was being put forth by Representative Sheehan, um, I just wanted to make sure if that's what went forward, that there was a clarifier in there that said, in a restaurant setting, um, this would apply, but in a banquet setting, you know, and, and I'm not doing, I probably shouldn't even use, I'll use a different example. Um, you know, there are, I know hundreds of people that have banquet rooms or that have private functions in their restaurants and close them down. Uh, and so the, those people, would they never be able to take the tip credit again because maybe they had one event or, or, you know, they, or they have a banquet room in the back that they use once every month. Um, it just doesn't seem right. So I was trying to help the existing language, but I do not support the existing language and neither does our organization. And, and I will be happy to send everything that we've talked about to, to the analyst, uh, Mr. Langland's excellent. He's a wonderful guy. He's always very responsive. I'll send him what I have and you folks can certainly do what you will with what, what it is. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to point out, as we saw in the previous bill, every single word in a bill in the language is really important. Appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. I think many of us who have served a few years have uh, PTSD around the word and. Uh, that being said, uh, any more questions for Mr. Dougal? I would like to say, if I could, Senator Daughtry, that we support everything that Senator Sanborn said. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for the clarification. Um, with that, we have uh, Mr. Mitchell, you're up next. Thank you, Senator. Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, members of the committee, Jim Mitchell, on behalf of the Maine Tourism Association. The committee, I hope, is in possession of testimony, written testimony from Alice and Susie of Maine Tourism. And I'll simply touch on a few highlights that uh, Allison uh, put in her written testimony. First and foremost, I think it was quite helpful to the committee that uh, actual operators of dining establishments, uh, Ms. Corey, Mr. DeMillo, and uh, Senator Sanborn were able to shed some additional light uh, on the complexities around uh, the service charge here in Maine, particularly because of its variance from the federal definition. It'll be well worthwhile each committee member to take a look at the Maine definition. It is uh, not clear at all, as Representative Sheehan pointed out, there are a lot of gray areas in it. But we do appreciate very much the sponsor's intent to provide options to restaurants for better wages for employees. Senator Sanborn, I think, touched on one of the critical aspects, though, of linking tip wage getting rid of the tip wage for those who wish to charge a service charge increases the disparity between those at the back of the house, line cooks, dishwashers, et cetera, and those at the front of the house, servers who are often making a very good living, not always, but often making a very good living and increasing their wages to the minimum wage in Portland, for example, at $13 an hour may not accomplish the equity that many people want in the restaurants. Further, I think that there are real concerns from Maine Tourism Association that the language as drafted will not really clarify, but may complicate a really already complicated area of law around service charges here in Maine. The Senator touched on disparity that might be created by uh, taking away the tip credit opportunity for restaurateurs who want to use a service charge, but there may be a, also a possible adverse consequence to servers. Mr. DeMillo, for example, pointed out three and a half percent as a reasonable service charge. But if the math were done, it is possible that, in fact, a restaurateur who wanted to recoup all her or his costs to basically use a service charge but not be eligible to use a tip wage may have to use a service charge that is substantially more to recover those costs for those wages. The diner then might be in a position where she or he may not be able to afford to tip as generously they previously did because there's some downward pressure from that consequence of putting a much higher surcharge, which is typically right now in the low single digits. That might actually depress wages or service, which is obviously not the consequence that I think anybody on this committee would like. Um, this delicate balance, uh, service fees to help increase pay for more workers, yet the elimination of the tip credit in exchange for that opportunity is really the fundamental basis of our opposition to the legislation as drafted. With that, Madam Chair, I'd be pleased to try to answer any questions the committee may have, and thank you for, take, for uh, taking my comments into consideration as you deliberate on this bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitchell. Do I have any questions from the committee? And I do from Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Mr. Mitchell. Um, I was curious, um, one of the things that I enjoy doing as I drive around the state is noticing all of the, uh, the different wage signs uh, the restaurants are putting up in front of their buildings and trying to keep track of what the difference is in a Dunkin' Donuts in Scarborough versus uh, Fort Kent versus, uh, right? And so I was wondering if you guys had collected any information on that in terms of um, what the average wage is right now uh, with folks in your association and whether or not, and, and or what, whether you could provide that for the work session if, if you find you have later. I'm unaware if we have, but I'll certainly find out from Allison. There may be some uh, wage surveys that have been done and perhaps we can dig around with DOL as well. I agree with you though. There is obviously significant wage pressure all across our state and across the country uh, to attract workers, particularly in these very difficult jobs in some of these restaurants. It creates a very different discussion if it most does. people are already at the minimum wage uh, to attract servers. Uh, or not. And so, so it really, you know, it does, it does set up a, a different disparity. Uh, so I appreciate that. Great. Do you have any other questions for Mr. Mitchell? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I do believe that concludes all the testimony we had in opposition. If there's anyone else in the waiting room who had intended to testify in opposition, please use the raise hand function. 
Seeing none, um, if there is anyone present who wishes to testify neither for nor against, we have no one signed up currently, but please once again, use the raise hand function if you intend to do so. Okay, seeing none, are there any questions from the committee at this time that we wanna make sure that we have for our esteemed analyst? Representative Pebworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would appreciate, um, just for my laziness, links to um, some of the, the definitions and um, the previous statute. Um, in particular, the definitions of restaurant, banquet, private club. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, with that, I will close the public hearing on LD 1878. Up next, uh, we will be taking up our own uh, Representative Sylvester's bill. We'll be switching on to LD 1879, an act to support law enforcement officers, correction officers, 911 dispatchers, firefighters, and emergency medical services persons diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And the floor is yours, Representative Sylvester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Daughtry, Representative Me, and esteemed colleagues of the Committee on Labor and Housing, I'm here today to testify in favor of LD 1879, an act to support law enforcement officers, correction officers, E911 dispatchers, firefighters, and emergency medical service persons diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. For that's exactly what this bill does. It supports those folks. The folks who were there for most of us in the worst moments of our lives, moments which will often be amongst the worst moments of their lives so that they can support us. Now, this is a very simple bill. All that it does is strike the sunset clause, which was originally put in when the original statute creating a rebuttable presumption for first responders was signed into law by Governor LePage. The workers' compensation director under Governor LePage, Paul Signalfi, testified in favor of the bill because he believed the science backed up such a presumption and he believed it was good medical practice to get early treatment. The reason the sunset clause was put in was so that a future legislature could receive a report to the effectiveness of the measure and to ascertain the cost benefit of the presumption. Well, the other day, this committee heard the results of that report from now Director John Rohde. The data showed that the program achieved the goal of more first responders seeking treatment and yet seems to have saved rather than cost money. It has also had the side benefit of many communities and the professional associations of those professions forming peer-to-peer -peer counseling groups and providing better awareness and acceptance of PTSD amongst a community who sometimes has a hard time admitting weakness or asking for help. It's the nature of that job. This is an incredibly important bill to continue a successful program. By allowing first responders and other personnel to get that treatment early, we're not only significantly improving the lives of those who will support us and our communities, but we avoid the lengthy absence from works that are so expensive to the system. It's a win-win. This is not a bipartisan issue. So I ask you, my colleagues, to turn in, in turn to support law enforcement officers, correction officers, E-91 dispatchers, firefighters, and emergency medical service persons diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. We get a couple bills a year where we can all agree that a program is worth all of us supporting. I believe this is one of those. Now, members of this committee have heard me talk about how this bill came into being, about the, the hearing at which, you know, filled a room filled with firefighters and police officers. They found one person who was, was willing to get up and testify about their experiences how difficult that testimony was for this firefighter, how we shut off the clock because someone foolishly put me in the chair. And, uh, and we spent the next several hours with these officers and, and uh, policemen and, and other first responders coming up and telling their stories, many of whom have never said these stories out loud. And when I think about those stories, and I, as I was writing my testimony, I was sort of recalling the original stories and Many of those, although I said in my testimony that, that our worst moments become their worst moments, 
What we have to remember is that these first responders aren't going to people's homes in many parts of the state where they don't know who they're responding on. They are part of this community. They're going to their neighbor's homes in their worst moment. They're going to their brothers. They're going to people they went to high school with and their children. And, and that's who they're responding to. And so it sort of, most of the stories that I heard were about those kinds of moments where someone they knew was in crisis and they were not able to just let that go as the normal course of a day. And so I really want to, you know, we heard the report, right? I think that the sunset was put in for a good reason. And now it's time to keep this successful program going. Uh, and that's what this bill does. And with that, I uh, am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative. I have a question from Representative Prescott followed by Representative Bradstreet. Well, thank you. Do you recall what the LD was on the previous bill that we passed? Oh, um, you know what? I believe it was it was uh, then Assistant Majority Leader Golden who put it in. I think it's in his testimony, um, which is he sent in written testimony for this bill. So I, I think when I read that, the number is in there. But I too many LDs under the bridge, Representative, for me to. <laughs> Thanks, man. Representative Bradstreet, and I, I'm sure we'll uh, uh, Representative Prescott will will get the LD to jog all of our. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative, for bringing this up. Uh, so the uh, the groups that are included in your bill are the same groups for which we had the data presented by Mr. Rohde uh, back along several, a couple weeks ago. So what's happened, and this is something that I kind of wanted to discuss with the committee. Um, so other groups have been added to that statute. And so the sunset includes for those them as well. So this means people we've just added last year that we don't have any data on. I was trying to determine what I thought a reasonable period of time was for us to receive another report, uh, you know, and to be able to write legislation if we wanted to um, about that. And so that was actually, um, I'm sitting here looking at this note right in front of me that I was supposed to ask during my uh, testimony. Uh, but but that's something I want to talk about in the work session. I mean, I definitely want another report. Um, I want us to be able to put out legislation or whoever is sitting in these chairs then to put out legislation. Uh, but I, 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 it was a serious question to me what, was, or what a reasonable amount of time was to do that. A year clearly seems too much. Ten years or not enough. Ten years seems too much. You know, so maybe it's the same amount of time as from the original group for each group that gets added. I just didn't have a clear answer on that. So I, I really wanted your counsel on that. Thank you, Representative. Do I have uh, any follow-ups, Representative Bradstreet or? No, I don't. I will take my hand down. No worries. Um, any other questions from the committee at this time? Let's see, not seeing anything. Uh, Representative Sylvester, thank you for presenting the bill. Um, I am double checking, but I do not see any other legislators or co-sponsors here to present. Is that correct, Justin? I believe uh, uh, Representative Rader is on to speak. Wonderful. Representative Rader. Floor is thank yours. you so much. And I will lower my hands, so do not forget. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and fellow illustrious, intelligent, and good-looking members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Amy Rader, as I hope you know by now, and I represent House District 125, which includes part of Bancor. I speak before you today in support of LD 1879, an act to support law enforcement officers, officers corrections officers, E911 dispatchers, firefighters, and emergency medical service persons diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. For our corrections officers, dispatchers, firefighters, and emergency medical service providers bearing witness to traumatic events is a reality they know all too well. When called to act quickly in a moment of emergency, our first responders have limited time to emotionally process the incident before them and are often forced to compartmentalize their trauma, hopefully having the opportunity to consider what they experienced at a later time. There are many longitudinal studies that examine the impacts of PTSD stemming from the work of first responders, and I'm sure you're going to hear some of those firsthand accounts today. Um, this is where I'm going to depart a little bit from my written testimony because 
this is my first session, but I've heard those stories too. In a former job, I spent a lot of time speaking with first responders specifically about those traumatic stories. And then in my in yet another job, because I've worn so many hats professionally in my life, I was actually working in a school with children who experienced PTSD. And I saw what a little treatment and a little access to treatment can do to mitigate the effects of that PTSD. We have the opportunity to do something very powerful and very meaningful, something very small that will make a giant difference in the lives of people. And I hope you will join me in, in supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Rader. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, up next, we have uh, Michael Kraus joining us. Michael, the floor is yours. And I should say, uh, this is for folks wishing to testify in support of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Chairman, Chairwoman Daughtry and Representative Sylvester and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today in support of LD 1879. My name is Michael Krause. I reside in the town of Kittery, and I'm the president of the Professional Firefighters of Maine, representing the views of over 1,000 professional firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, and dispatchers. I have submitted our written testimony for your review and consideration, so hopefully my comments this morning will be brief. As you know, LD 1879 simply removes the sunset provision outlined in the current statute and will make permanent PTSD as a rebuttable presumptive for our first responders. We believe that maintaining this presumptive coverage for those suffering from PTSD is critical to ensuring these individuals can access the care needed to recover from this condition. The successes that we have achieved are consistent with the nation le national level trends for treating first responders with PTSD and helping them return to the job. As you know, our first responders work in inherently dangerous environments where they routinely assist critical ill and injured individuals and respond to some of the worst disasters imaginable. These first responders fill an all hazard response role and commonly respond to fires, medical emergencies, life-threatening accidents, hazardous material exposures, suicides, as well as responding to mass casualty, casualty incidents, natural disasters, and terrorist incidents. Our fire departments are the largest providers of pre-hospital emergency medical services and over the last two years, this has led to fire and EMS personnel serving on the front lines of the war against COVID-19. The increased call volume and risk of bringing serious virus, the serious virus back to their homes and families have compounded the stress the fire and EMS personnel experience daily. In addition, I would also refer you to the written testimony of Dr. Abby Morris and clinician Amy Davenport, who will be speaking shortly for their opinion on the cause and effect of PTSD on our first responders, as well as our members and local leaders that will be testifying before you this morning as well. Without this presumptive coverage of PTSD for first responders, it may be highly unlikely for these individual providers to pinpoint the exact exposure that led to their development of the condition. PTSD can have devastating consequences if untreated or misdiagnosed and is often associated with other mental health disorders such as depression, substance abuse, family dis dysfunction, violence, and increased risk for suicide. Also, when firefighters themselves recognize their need for treatment, individuals often encounter challenges accessing the treatment in independently. Many common barriers to accessing care include struggling to identify quality, qualified medical health professionals, coordinating time off from work, and funding out-of-pocket treatment costs when an individual's health insurance coverage maximums are met or doesn't cover the treatment at all. These, bur these burdens should not be placed solely on the firefighter for, develop for developing PTSD that is overwhelmingly likely to have been caused by work-related exposures. Laws permitting the presumptive coverage of PTSD are critical in providing the early intervention needed to provide effective treatment. Our state's presumptive PTSD law raises awareness about PTSD and helps destigmatize those firefighters seeking treatment for their illness. Most importantly, presumptive recognition of occupational connected uh, nature of PTSD 
helps to knock down the institutional barriers and bureaucratic delays uh, to impede first responders in accessing the timely uh, care they need. We have, great, we have made great strides here in Maine to utilize peer support teams and a network of mental health professionals knowledgeable about the unique stressors that first responders face. The fact that Maine provides this presumptive recognition of PTSD without seeing significant cost increase to workers' compensation program is a testament to the value of the timely and effective PTSD treatments for our first responders and EMS personnel. Continuing our state's presumptive coverage of PTSD for first responders is a good public policy for, for the state of Maine and allows us to stand by the men and women who sacrifice their own health and safety for the protection of our communities. With that said, members of the committee, thank you for the time to address this important matter. And Maine's first responders uh, are here asking for your support in passing LD 1879, and will make myself available for any questions, should there be any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Krause. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Up next, I have Amy davenport Dakin, followed by, uh, looks like Susan Haas. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee today in support of LD 1879. I have submitted an extensive written testimony that I encourage everybody to review as a way to explain more some of the points that I'm bringing up today. As stated, my name is Amy Davenport Dakin and I am the Behavioral Health Director for the Professional Firefighters of Maine. I am also the owner and a clinician at New Perceptions. My practice is dedicated to treating first responders. PTSI, post-traumatic stress injury, is a more accurate description of what our first responders are facing. PTSD is the most commonly used descriptor due to the DSM-5, but it must be noted that an injury is a more appropriate descriptor as there are biological-based changes in the brain that occur from repeated trauma exposures. PTSD can cause intense thoughts and feelings about the traumatic event that lasts long after the event is over. In the case of first responders, multiple and chronic traumatic events lead to the diagnosis of PTSD. I'm providing this explanation of changes in the brain as a way for others to understand the importance of this bill. This bill would help decrease stigma, allow members time to recover from PTSD and return to work. PTSD is treatable, but it is a hazard of the job. I've been working with the professional firefighters of Maine and Bates College to obtain current data about behavioral health issues in the fire service. This data has been obtained within the past few months. The PCL-5, a PTSD measure, was used to measure symptoms. Some preliminary data shows high reported symptoms are feeling and are acting as though the stressful experience were actually happening again, avoiding external reminders of the events, feeling distant or cut off from people, irritable behavior, angry outbursts, and or acting aggressively, as well as feeling upset when something reminded the person of the experience. The PHQ-9 depression measure was also used. Alarmingly, this is very alarmingly, a high number of respondents reported thoughts they may be better off dead or thoughts of harming themselves. A high percentage reported feeling down and depressed almost every day. The anxiety scale was used to measure the anxiety levels and a high percentage reported feeling nervous, anxious, and on edge and difficulty controlling their worry. These are symptoms we are seeing as clinicians across the board for all first responders that is clinically significant and secondary to their job. It also confirms what many are reporting day to day as, as they come in to see us. And the pandemic has really pushed this forward as well. Due to the work they're exposed to constant traumas that affect the neurobiology of the brain, we need to come forward as a state to help our first responders get the help of what they need. In conclusion, continuing the state's efforts to support first responders by bringing forward LD 1879 is a huge step for to protect our first responders. This bill will allow members to access services they need, obtain adequate treatment, and aid in decreasing the stigma of accessing behavioral health services. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Do I have any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony and for being here with us this morning for one more minute, or it's this afternoon. 
Uh, Representative Cuddy. Thank you. Sorry, I was trying to work any number of things at the same time and typically failing at all of them at the same time. Um, Ms. Dakin, thank you so much uh, for being here and for your testimony. And um, I'm curious about uh, how, how have municipalities cooperated in treatment along these uh, lines and what are the sort of the benefits of early treatment for PTSD? The benefits is building resiliency. And one thing we're noting in the data is the sooner we get in, whether it's SISM interventions, critical incident stress management, when an event immediately happens or early treatment, is the outcome may be, I say may be because everybody's individual, less likely to for the individual to develop PTSD. So early intervention is key. And one thing I've been doing a lot of is spending numerous hours in fire stations, presenting trainings on burnout, resiliency, coping skills to help target that. We're gaining steam a lot with municipalities to tell you the truth. The pandemic has actually, unfortunately, done me a favor with many municipalities because they're well aware they're, they're losing staff. They can't maintain staff. People are burned out. Workman comp claims are going up. So they're really open to hearing about ways to do prevention work. I'm working with a lot of chiefs now that are bringing me into the department because they are well aware there's a problem. And many times they call me and they're like, I don't know what we need, but we need something. So we're, we're gaining steam on that. But we know clinically in all the data, early intervention is key to long-term outcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time and your testimony. Up next, I have Susan Hawes. And hopefully I'm saying that right. Yes, thank you. We can Good hear afternoon, you. Senator. I can't see you oh. one second. Oh. Are you able to start your video at all? If not, no worries. Oh, Got there it. You. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Floor is yours. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and all the distinguished members of the committee. My name is Sue Hawes. I live in Portland. I'm here in support of LD 1879 to help other first responders avoid what happened to my husband. Hindsight being 2020, my husband, a former Maine corrections officer, and I want to share with the committee his personal story about how an officer's sudden and uncharacteristic symptoms of PTSD were handled at his workplace of 10 years, the Cumberland County Jail. My husband, Deputy Philip Hawes, mainly worked the busy weekday shift as a corrections officer in a two-man post. He rarely worked any significant amount of overtime. However, after staffing cuts in October 2015, he was now alone trying to meet the needs of up to 86 inmates in the jail pod. A sufferer of epilepsy since he was 15 years old, the workplace stress apparently set off what resulted in a catastrophic increase in epileptic seizures in 2016. In my testimony, you can see the graph. Unfortunately, to stay within my allowed time this morning, I will have to skip some of the important details found in my written testimony and go directly to the PTSD incident. My husband's last day at work at Cumberland County Jail. On, a, on April 7, 2017, Deputy Hawes attempted to address a previous day's incorrect inmate count with his lieutenant. The lieutenant had violated jail policy by allowing inmate movement during the count. In response to Deputy Hawes's concern, the lieutenant apparently argued with Deputy Hawes and stood up aggressively and yelled at him, go to your post or go home triggering my husband's first PTSD symptoms that I'm aware of since we met in 1992. According to numerous eyewitness reports, nothing terrible happened that day, but a loud verbal confrontation and physical signs of distress, shaking, et cetera. Deputy Hawes agreed to take the rest of the day off and his coworkers took him home. The sheriff immediately put Deputy Hawes on paid administrative leave and barred him from returning to the workplace. This incident happened just weeks after I, Sue Hawes, Deputy Hawes' wife, spoke publicly on March 13, 2017 at a Cumberland County Commissioner's meeting 
about the growing issues at the jail since the 2015 staffing cuts. Deputy Hawes was diagnosed with PTSD in early 2018. With support and therapy, my husband again shows no symptoms of PTSD. Indeed, if PTSD had been his only medical condition, and if this law had covered corrections officers at the time, and if the incident had been handled professionally, Deputy Hawes would have received timely treatment through workers' compensation and most likely have gone back to work soon after. PTSD treatment works in most cases. I urge you to continue to show your support for the mental health of our first responders by voting ought to pass on this bill to eliminate the sunset provision and retain the rebuttable presumption of PTSD for first responders. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions now or in the future. Thank you so much for your testimony and for sharing your own uh, personal story. Do I have any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, we had next signed up to testify. We had Kristen Hagen and Don Heiser who um, were not seeing the participants list. If you're here under another name, please use the raise hand reaction. Seeing none, I think we're gonna move on to Paul Gasper um, as followed by Ronnie Green. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours. And I see Paul, I don't know if he's able to unmute himself. Let's see. Yes, I'm actually just trying to start the video. Okay, there it is, fantastic. <laughs> well, congratulations and uh, good morning, Senator Daughtry, uh, Representative Sylvester, uh, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Paul Gaspar. I'm a resident of South Portland, uh, and I'm speaking to you in my capacity as the executive director of the Maine Association of Police, or MAP, as it's uh, often called. I'm also proud to be speaking on behalf of the Maine Law Enforcement Coalition, uh, of which our organization is one of the founding members, uh, along with the Maine State Law Enforcement Association, State Troopers Association, and Fraternal Order of Police. The coalition speaks collectively on behalf of our combined memberships of approximately 2,000 law enforcement officers and public safety dispatchers throughout the state of Maine. Um, I'm here today in, in full support of LD 879. Um, and there's a couple of things I want to commend Mr. Uh, Chris Coleman from earlier uh, for his analogous use of sunsets and just where we can find inspiration. I could tell you first responders throughout the state of Maine, we're a small community. Uh, we represent over 2000 people of which there probably are a total of about 2,900 law enforcement officers uh, currently in the state of Maine. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave a lot of my testimony for you because um, too many times we get bogged down in specific statistics and numbers. Uh, I prefer to speak, uh, from the heart, so to speak, and hopefully um, following Mr. Coleman uh, in trying to address my horrible habit of uh, over scheduling myself. I've been reading uh, a book on time management and something stuck out to me. Um, Mr. Berkman in his book, uh, the average human lifespan is absurdly, insultingly brief. Assuming you live to be 80, you have just over 4,000 weeks. That's impactful to me, 4,000 weeks doesn't seem like a lot of time. Uh, and considering uh, first responders um, have less of a life expectancy because of what they see over the course of their careers, usually by 10 or 20 years, uh, the CDC in 2021 said the actual uh, life expectancy in our country is about 77.5, uh, which if you subtract 10 or 20 years, uh, which first responders uh, seem to be at, um, 4,000 weeks becomes quite precious. And in many of those cases, uh, um, we miss a lot of those 4,000 weeks because of the job that we've all chosen to take and the oaths that we've taken. Um, those in law enforcement, as well as our fellow first responders and fire, EMS dispatchers, uh, are the on the precipice of an all-encompassing health emergency. 
Um, and a lot of this goes to some of the history of where we are in Maine. Um, and I also point to this reminding me of John Stewart, uh, who said, um, we need to do better for the most important commodity for first responders, which is time. I will leave by saying my own experience last year in and amongst all of our pandemic, we lost three officers to suicide, two retired, one active. Uh, because of our small community, I knew, worked, and was friends with all three. Uh, I see their faces every morning when I get up, <clears throat> and I see them every night. Uh, LD-848 created the rebuttable presumption in 2017. Prior to that, uh, a prior legislator, legislature tried to eliminate PTSD as a compensable injury. So we've come quite far since 2015. Um, on behalf of myself and those who are no longer with us, I don't want their legacy to be that of loss or why we lost them. I want your help in making their legacy uh, to spurn us on to simply do better for our first responders. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Gasper, for your testimony and for your startling uh, summation of how many weeks on average we all have. That is a very brutal and stark reminder, so thank you. Thank you. And I, I was unable to attach a second document, but I do have the report that is referenced uh, in my testimony, which I'm happy to share um, if you'd like. If you could send that through our um, our clerk, um, yes. to make sure that it reaches all the members, and that'd be a great way to get that included in the file. Do I have Thanks. any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time and your testimony. Up next, I have Ronnie Green. Ronnie, the floor is yours. Good morning, Senator. Can, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Labor and Housing Committee. My name is Ronnie Green, and I reside in the town of Plymouth. I'm a district vice president and a peer team member with the Professional Firefighters of Maine, and I'm here today to speak in support of LD 1879. You will hear a lot of testimony today regarding PTSD and how it, has, how it has and continues to affect the lives of our first responders. You will also hear how early intervention is helping in getting people treated and back to work. While the stigma around PTSD and other mental health injuries is getting better and more people are reaching out for help and reaching out earlier, not everyone is. My place here for just a second. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Um, there are several old school first responders out there that are not reaching out <clears throat> because of the stigma and ongoing fear of retaliation by their employer if they do reach out. There are several that don't have the access to early intervention and some that just don't understand the importance of of early intervention and good mental health care. There is even a reluctancy from some employers to offer help, set up critical, critical incident stress debriefings, or just send someone to a counselor simply because they don't want to pay. A question has been asked several times, why are there more claims and first reports of injuries being filed? That answer is simple. The stigma is slowly but surely being reduced People feel it is okay to file, and they may be taken care of if they do so. Some are filing when they never, some are filing and never pursuing a claim because they are not seeking help, uh, because they are seeking help through peer support teams or therapy and are not losing time from work. And in several cases, they're using their own sick time and vacation time to cover lost time. The, this rebuttable Rebuttable presumption has not skyrocketed the cost of workers' compensation. While we are doing a much better job today than we have in the past five years or more, we are not there yet. PTSD has not gone away and is still a problem today. We can't go backwards in Maine and let this provision in the workers' comp statute sunset. We need to pass this bill and continue to take care of our first responders. I would like to thank Representative Sylvester for bringing this important bill forward, and I would like to thank you and 
you all for your time and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Green. Do I have any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Up next, we have BJ McAllister. Mr. McAllister, the floor is yours. Uh, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is BJ McAllister. I am the president of the Resurgum Group, and I'm here today to testify on behalf of my client, the Maine AFL CIO. The Maine AFL CIO represents 40,000 working men and women in the state of Maine. We work to improve the lives and working conditions of our members and all working people. Workers' compensation is the result of a historic grand bargain between labor and management. In the early 20th century, management was given complete immunity from suit and tort. Never having to answer to a jury about negligence is a very valuable tool to employers. In exchange, labor was supposed to receive adequate and prompt wage replacement and medical coverage for workplace injuries. In 2017, a former version of this committee recognized that the original promise of workers' compensation was not being met for working people serving in the public and various law enforcement jobs. During that legislature, a new law was passed that created a rebuttable presumption for post-traumatic stress disorder. This legislation protects that change, which without your action will sunset on October 1st, 2022. The unfortunate stereotype in these professions is of a quote unquote tough professional who helps others with their problems. Too often, the worker lacks support to talk about what they see at work, resulting in missed opportunities to improve outcomes from post-traumatic stress disorder. Making the rebuttable presumption for PTSD for these workers will help keep the work, the, keep people working and safe. The right to have good medical treatment will keep people from unhealthy coping mechanisms like drugs, alcohol, and suicide. In addition to ensuring that there's access to good treatment for PTSD, a rebuttable presumption helps encourage workers to seek treatment by limiting the fear that they may lose the job if they reach out. We ask you to support LD 1879, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. McAllister. Do I have any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your time this morning. Afternoon, afternoon. Slip right by, right? Um, up next, we're checking order to see who's present. We had a few others sign up to testify in favor. Um, do we have Dr. Abby Morris with us at all? Or Darren McGovern? Not my, ap my apologies. I'm going to look for them right now. Also, looking at the attendee list, we do have two people registered as John York. So just a reminder, if you're in um, the attendee section or the panelists and you've gotten a link, um, please make sure that you're renamed or named as your actual name. So when we're going through this, that's a little bit easier for Justin to be able to go through and promote folks. So just a little housekeeping. I am not seeing McGovern or Morris. If I overlooked that, could you please raise your hand? Okay, looks like that's a no. So then I do believe we are on to John York. Would the real John York please raise your hand so that we can um, promote you to be a panelist? And Dustin looks like we have raised hand going. And welcome John, the floor is yours. There we go. Okay. There you go. How are you doing? <laughs> we can see you. Welcome. Technology is not my friend. <laughs> my no wife's. At all. And uh, I need my glasses. We're all going through the same boat, so don't worry. Yeah, I used to make fun of my coworkers. I should never have done that. <laughs> Senator, Madam Chair, to the members of the Labor and Housing Committee, my name is John York. I am now a retired firefighter for the city of Bangor. I'm writing 
this testimony today to ask for your consideration to make LD 1879 a permanent bill. I've been involved in the fire service for over 30 years. As a volunteer firefighter a few years, and then a career firefighter from February 6, 1995 until April 18th, 2020. That's the day I had to retire due to an injury that I sustained in 2015 that resulted in PTSD. After I recovered from my incident in 2015, there were lots of calls, pomp and circumstance. I was asked to go to city council meetings. I was given an award for my bravery, along with letters from congressmen and senators and being told how important I was and what a great job that you do. Then someday something breaks in your mind. Now with this bill, there is hope that there will be help for other brothers and sisters. I was in Augusta in 2017 to support this bill and I should have put in the crowd. And then after listening to people testify, I made a decision to be one of the ones to also testify to help debunk the myth that everyone was really getting help and that the workers comp system was really working. I was able to retire thanks to help from my brothers and sisters, a local 772 and the hours that they donated to me to get my retirement date. Not everyone has this opportunity. What if this is a new person on the job or has less than five or 10 years? They would have had their whole career ahead of them and they can't get the help they need. That could save their life or allow them to continue in their profession. In my opinion, this bill can help that our brothers and sisters and they need this and deserve it. What if it was your son or daughter that needed the help and all you got was pushback from the place of work? I filled out all the proper paperwork. I gave as much information as I could. I tried to get workers comp or the city to help me, but there was no help. They sent me through three doctor's offices. After fighting for help, they told me the only way I could get help is if I retired or in my case, quit my job. I hadn't put enough years in to retire yet. And what kind of answer is that? You have to quit something that you love to do, that you've done so well, that you've been told that you cut your career short because the city you work for doesn't believe you. After requesting help from the city and being denied, I started to see a psychologist out of my own pocket and continue to see him to this day. My psychologist uses the final cabinet comparison. Your mind fills up with all the things you see, experience, but then one day you have no more space to put your files in. Something broke in my mind. And despite the help that I've been receiving, you, you can get physical help for all the physical wounds but the ones in your brain and memory aren't. You don't realize because you're working the job day to day and day out, working overtime because of staffing issues, doing all the things you're supposed to do. And then one day your wife finally has the courage to say, you need to get the help. Things have changed. I went to work with my coworkers. I was, sorry, I was fortunate. I was heavily involved in the union. The people, were able to point me in the right direction and speak with some professionals to deals with firefighters and other first responders. I did not realize how bad things had gotten, but I knew that I didn't want to lose my wife. So I knew I needed to do something and needed to talk to somebody. Working for the city was a great career. I saw a lot of things through the years, some good and some horrible things that I don't want to repeat, but I play it over and over again in my head. The hardest part about being a paramedic firefighter is not having the support of the city that you work for in the state that you live in. I could go on and on, and I certainly hope that this bill becomes a permanent bill to help all the members of the public safety departments through some of their darkest days that they will ever experience. I'm asking you to please support this bill. I urge you to pass this. I am available for further questions or comments if needed. Sincerely, John York, International Association of Firefighters, Local 772, Bangor Professional Firefighters, retired. I apologize for my shaky voice. No, thank you. You did wonderful. Public speaking is hard, and it's even harder when it's about something that is personal and impactful like this. So thank you for being willing to share your story. And 
all of us here as legislators, we do this on a, on a daily basis. And even for us, it can be very hard sometimes. So thank you. Do you oh. have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you so much for sharing your story and for speaking out. Have a wonderful Thank you, and thank you for your time. And I certainly hope you can pass this bill. Thank you. Um, up next, I do see in the chat that Dr. Abby Morris, I think is trying to rejoin with us, Justin, is that correct? Yes, I sent another invite. Hopefully um, that will work. I'm not sure exactly what the situation is. Okay. So uh, Dr. Morris, we'll try to uh, keep an eye out so that we can have you join. And then let's see whom else we have favor. Sorry, triple checking our list to make sure that we haven't forgotten anybody who hasn't spoken yet. It does appear that Dr. Morris is the last that I have in favor that hasn't gone yet. If you are a in the attendees and you had um, planned on uh, testifying in favor, could you please use the raise hand function so that we can uh, get you into the panelist portion. Okay, not seeing anyone and not seeing, let's see, did Dr. Morris just join us? Um, I think what we'll do with permission of the committee, we'll move on to those against. And when Dr. Morris is able to join us, if it's all right, we will switch back to get um, their testimony. Oh, looks like they are present. Let's see if we're able to move Dr. Morris over. Joy. Very complicated. She's in the chat. She's here, but she doesn't show up in the participants. So yeah. Seems like we have a Monday tech hacks. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, Dr. Morris, we're gonna keep trying to bring you in. So hopefully we'll be able to get there. If not, we can also have you call in if that's potentially easier, easier as well. So, um, and uh, Justin's uh, urging, you may have to leave the meeting and come back in so we're able to promote you. So with that, I think we'll move on to those who are testifying against um, and then circle back. Um, do we have Kate, I'm so sorry if I get your name wrong, DeFore from Maine Municipal Association. And I see Kate. I am promoting her right now. Perfect. Kate, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Senator Dostry, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Labor Committee. My name is Kate Dufour, and I'm here on behalf of the Maine Municipal Association to provide testimony in opposition to 1879. I just want to stress the fact that we don't disagree with much of what the proponents had to say. We understand that the nature of this work is difficult, that it causes stress, that there's stigma, and there's a need for access to treatment. So we're on the same page with respect to all of those points. But we do have, we do oppose the bill for two particular reasons. The first is we have a disagreement with the Workers' Compensation Board a conclusion with respect to the cost of PTSD presumption. And the second is we're concerned with the absence of solutions uh, in this bill addressing underlying issues as well as funding a mandate, a shift to the property taxpayers. So first, with respect to the Workers' Compensation the board's conclusion. I would ask you to look when you have a chance at page nine of the December 22 report. And there's a table in that on that page uh, that leads to the conclusion that there hasn't been really much of an increase in costs associated with the, um, the presumption that was enacted in 2017. And what it does, it compares pre and post presumption costs. And the, the, the problem with the conclusion is it assumes that an injury occurs and closes, a, gain, a claim opens and closes on the same year, when as a matter of fact, a claim develops over time. And so in this report, when you look at the pre-presumption uh, costs of a 2015 uh, claim, you see that it's roughly $84,000. It's difficult to compare that to the post-presumption claim of 2020, uh, which is $6,000. Uh, dollars worth of expense to the insurance company or the, to the to the individual, because the 15 claim has had seven years of development, where the 20 claim has had only two. 
So in order to get a true, uh, a true picture as to what this actually costs, you would have to take the 2020, um, 2020 costs, projection, project the accumulated cost to 27, and make that comparison between 2015 and 2027. At that point, it would be an apples to apples comparison because each of those claims would have seven years worth of development. We would contend that the costs are going to be uh, far more costly than what's reported in that, in that report. So that's our first concern. We don't think you're looking at apples to apples data. The, the second is, as you heard, a presumption that presumption that was adopted in 2017 did not and cannot change the nature of the work, the shortcomings in the mental health system, uh, the need for uh, to, to, for early intervention, or where raise um, awareness or the impact or impact the cultural changes that would be necessary. We believe, as you do, that access to treatment as early as possible is what keeps our people safe. Um, and so we are asking for the state to partner with us on two fronts. Let's find the solutions to that underlying program. How do we ensure that our first responders have access to those who can diagnose and those who can treat uh, related issues, not only in the more populated areas of the state, but throughout the state? You know, we're talking Dover, Foxcroft, you know, Callis, everywhere. Everybody who serves as a first responder, responder is deserving of that level of care. And we ask you to help us make sure that we get that care across the state. And the second is, this is an unfunded state mandate. You have an opportunity to share with us as property taxpayers, the cost of keeping these vital public employees safe from harm. So we ask as you move forward, that you help us find the solutions and that you help us pay for these costs. And I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so much. Do I have any questions from the committee? Representative Cuddy, followed by Representative Drinkwater. Thank you, Senator Dr. And thank you, Mr. Ford, for being here uh, to testify on the bill and explain MMA's opposition to it. Um, so from the report that was uh, Mr. Rohde presented to us um, earlier in January, it seems clear that more people are entering the system earlier, that in fact, we are seeing uh, people get this early intervention, which the workers' comp board said is bringing cost per case down. So we're seeing a relatively flat cost structure. And I understand you're saying that it's not apples to apples. And I, I can't ex tell you that I fully understand that. But the number of people applying uh, is greater. So they're getting into treatment earlier. And the cost per case is going down. It seems like for a very small change, if there is a change in costs, we're seeing a real benefit to the people doing the work who are suffering from, uh, as, as you've agreed, the, the stress of the job. So do you not see that, I guess, do you not see that more people are entering? Do you not agree that more people are entering uh, earlier? You know, I, I don't have access to the statistics. I'm, I don't work for the insurance company, but I can tell you that we do believe as municipal management, we do believe that access, um, earlier access to um, services is vital and it can keep costs down. So we agree with that. But the, the issue at hand is with respect to the statistics, we are making apples to apples, excuse me, apples to oranges comparisons. When we look at 2015 data and we can't compare it to 2020 data because those claims in 15 have been paid out over a, um, a time period of seven years where the 2020 have only had two years worth of development. Now we might be wrong, but what we're asking is for a fair comparison of what this program is costing. So you'd have to look at the 2020, you'd have to project those costs five additional years, or excuse me, seven years to 2017, and then you can make uh, those adjustments. We don't think that the data before you is um, sufficient to make that claim. The disclaimer, the conclusion that this there's no there hasn't been much increase uh, between the post uh, excuse me the pre and the post presumption. We're just asking for a fair comparison. We believe it'll be far more expensive than what you're seeing in that report, but we 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 would welcome to be wrong. We are just asking for a fair comparison of what this actually costs. Um, and, and then again, 
you know, the second part of my testimony is help us fund this and help us find the solutions that are needed. Because again, a presumption is not going to resolve uh, the underlying issues associated uh, with PTSD on our, on our public um, safety employees. Thank you, I have Representative Drinkwater followed by Representative Pebworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeFore. Your perspective is always unique. Uh, the, I think it was the first session of the 130th. I'm pretty sure it was from the city manager of Sanford came and he gave testimony on how much his workman's comp premiums have gone up and it was astronomical. We all agree that early treatment is the key and we would agree that they should be able to get it. The question I think that is, is dividing us here is at what cost? And do you, have you seen any statistics on other municipalities that are saying, hey, my workman's comp has gone up, you know, 60, 80, 70%. Do you have any of those statistics at all? We, this is where I get in trouble, right? So I kind of know what I'm talking about, but I really don't uh, because this insurance world is kind of frightening. Uh, but our, our risk management services, which is um, provides workers' compensation insurance to municipalities, we I think we uh, in a we have a fund, a workers' compensation fund, and I believe we provide services to roughly 400 communities. Um, and and the, the data that they're showing is since the um, uh, since since the uh, presumption went into place. Uh, some employers, maybe not all, have experienced uh, increases in claims and. I think I'm using the right uh, term uh, to just uh, $3.8 million. So there, there is an impact there. Um, I could probably get you much better, more informed information, but we are, as an insurance company, I'll admit, uh, experiencing, or our members are experiencing cost related to this particular pres presumption. And I can speak, sorry. I can speak for myself. That data would be uh, appreciative because you, you mentioned that this is an unfunded mandate and, and that would show evidence of such. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I have Representative Pepworth next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Four. Your testimony is always really helpful. Um, in the report, um, I'm just gonna read a couple of sentences. It is possible that increased awareness of and reduced stigma attached to PTSD is contributing to an increase in the number of first responders filing PTSD claims. It's also possible that efforts by employers, employer groups, and employee organizations to promote early intervention by way of employee assistance programs, peer-to-peer -peer communications, and when necessary medical treatment is reducing the severity of PTSD injuries. When I read that, I felt very hopeful that legislation such as this was making a change in the workplace for the better. Because as someone said earlier in their testimony, what we want are these first responders, these workers to come uh, fully whole to their job. And we desperately need them at their job. Um, you, you're asking us to look ahead in terms of the cost. But I might ask then if we were gonna move the sunset date out so that we would have more data to inform this decision, could you give us a date by which you might be comfortable and seeing that the data was actually reflecting what was happening with this change? Well, I, I think it would be nice to just look, I, you know, we can do projections, you can look a few years out, but again, just to point to making an apples to apples comparison with respect to what the actual expenses are associated with pre presumption. I don't think we know that. Um, but again, I will, I will agree with everybody all day long that access, earlier access to treatment, if it's available, um, is, is what we need. Um, it, it will help reduce those costs, but there are costs associated uh, with the presumption. And we take exception that a report uh, would suggest otherwise without doing a more apples to apples type of comparison. You know, again, maybe we're wrong. Maybe, you know, the early intervention doesn't have a, a longer tail associated with that claim that it becomes developed over, you know, maybe it's two years worth of claims rather than seven because of that early prevention. But we don't know the answers to that question based on the data that's presented in that particular report. So my suggestion is let's get more data. And that's fine. 
we're okay with that as well. If you want to extend the, the, the sunset date a few more years and have this group look at this, the, the data again, I guess that's one solution. Um, in the meantime, I mean, we really should be working on addressing the underlying issues as well. And maybe helping communities, uh, property taxpayers, uh, fund these increases. Thank you. You're welcome. I have Representative Bradstreet next. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ms. Dufour, for being here again. Uh, I think the subject was brought up uh, when we discussed the data we were looking at. Uh, that uh, it's, uh, the last year was at the initiation of COVID. And I wonder if Maine Municipal has, or anybody, if you can answer this, or maybe someone coming from behind you, uh, could uh, inform us as to whether or not the onset of COVID might have an effect on the, the breadth that this bill would entail or encompass. I, I certainly do not have the expertise to answer that question. Okay, good, thank you. I have Representative Cuddy. Thank you, Senator. Um, so from the conversation you had with Representative Pebworth, and what I think I'm starting to develop is an understanding of your point. If, if you look at, at a year such as 2018, which is the first year this sort of fully, uh, we're fully post um, presumption, the law taking effect that is, um, that year you could actually do an apples apples comparison at least for the uh, what four years that it's been in existence. If you had claims in 2018, then those claims were seen, you could see those claims in 2018, 19, 20, and 21. That claim has existed for those four years. So for a 2020 claim, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know, but for a 2018 claim, you got four years of data on them. That seems to me like we do have some data that we can use. Now, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to break out that claim over how much of that claim is in the total paid section of the table on page nine. Uh, for 2018, 19, 20, and 21. Um, that's something that maybe we can ask the um, workers' comp board to do, but um, we do seem to have some of that data. Is that something that you can break out through your insurer to look at an individual claim from individual claims from 2018 and see how that's gone through over time? I, I can certainly, I can. I can certainly ask. I know they have uh, models that they use to project costs. Um, and to the extent that they can share that information with me, I will share it with you. Thank you. Do I have any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We are gonna to try to get Dr. Uh, Morris into the Zoom now to give their testimony. So please bear with us as we skip out of order promoting them to be a panelist and fingers crossed this works. Yes, Dr. Morris, I do believe we have you with us. If you could unmute and start your video, we are ready for your testimony whenever you are. All right, let's see if that works this time. Am I here? Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh, better late than never, right? Definitely. Hello. Thank you very much, Chairman Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, distinguished members of the committee, labor and housing. Thank you so much, truly an honor to be here with you. My name is Dr. Abby Morris. I'm a physician of almost 20 years, graduate of Georgetown School of Medicine, residency at Johns Hopkins, uh, boarded in psychiatry, neurology and addiction medicine. Um, I've dedicated the last five years of my life to treating first responders as the medical director of the IAFF Center of Excellence at Be uh, Behavioral Health Care and Recovery here in Maryland. Uh, we've changed the lives of over 2,000 firefighters. I also volunteer as a medical consultant for my county's police SWAT team and CIT intervention team. I'm speaking today, of course, to uh, address the issue of PTSD disorder presumption for first responders and the LD 1879 and how vital this piece of legislation is to help uh, Maine's uniformed officers receive the health care treatment they need and deserve in order to return to their communities and careers as healthy, productive spouses, neighbors, 
friends and earners. I would present a lot of facts on traumas and suicide, but I fear that that would simply be reiterations of studies already presented and discussed by other expert speakers. And I have submitted a lot of that in my written testimony in very uh, strong detail. But simply put, um, the general population faces an average in their lifetime of about three traumas. But um, firefighters and police, they, they will get that in a uh, one shift, one shift three traumas. And they work an average of 20 years, often starting in their teens or 20s. If you add to that long shifts, interrupted circadian rhythms, terrible nutrition, uh, jarring tones, siren exposures, uh, exposure to extreme natural elements, and of course, the psychological distress from the bureaucratic and political environment they're now working in, um, you have the uniform services to um, a meaningfully increased risk of PTSD. So the general population has a risk of PTSD of around 7%, and the rate for um, police and fire is around 22%, and the rate at our center is 32% of the 2,137 patients we see so far. Incredibly important about that is the risk of the psychosocial consequences of PTSD, including domestic violence, divorce, addiction, bankruptcy, worst of all, suicide. Uh, the suicide risk of fire EMS police is incredibly high. I personally lost 10 uh, fire police officers that I know to suicide, and I will continue to fight to never see that outcome again. Um, if that's not um, eye-opening enough, multiple research studies show that those who suffer from PTSD have a six times higher rate of completed suicide um, than people who don't have that diagnosis. One interesting thing about the PTSD that uh, firefighters and police suffer is that they have a complex PTSD. That's typically reserved for people, oh my gosh, do not show me that I have 30 seconds left. Um, complex PTSD is usually reserved for Holocaust survivors and children sold into the sex trade of prisoners of war. That's uh, Those groups wake up every day and know they're gonna have something horrific and they have no control over that. First responders have the same thing. They wake up and even though they follow every protocol and they do everything perfectly right, they have no control, people will die. Um, and that ex uh, repeated exposure to death and mistrust and pain um, uh, really does affect the brain and psyche. And that is not as easy to diagnose, not as stereotypical. And without LD 1879, they will not have the opportunity to re have resources and the care they need. If you want to, I know I have 10 seconds left. I want to address one thing that's been said. To my knowledge, presumptive PTSD laws and mental health legislation successfully exists in 23 states, and presumptive cancer laws have existed since 1982 and have been signed into law for 40 states. None, to my knowledge, have ever been repealed for costing too much or re for being too burdensome in any jurisdiction which have enacted it. So I wanted to point that out because I know we just heard a little bit of, 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 the, of the testimony that uh, came prior to me. So I just want to say one more thing. Um, Unfortunately, Dr. Ah! Morris, that is your time by about 40 <laughs> seconds. And I, I, but I'm sure that there are folks who will ask you questions and okay. uh, you might be able to slip some of that information in during that. I had, I had yes, I will try to. Can I ask a question? I have one quote I wanted to say. Thank you so much. And we have Representative Drinkwater up next with a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Morris, thank you. Thank you. We all agree that early treatment for post-traumatic is extremely important. And what we're hearing today is we need this presump rebuttable presumption for uh, first responders. In your profession, do you think that we should give the same coverage to healthcare workers who also experience uh, you know, traumatic events in hospital settings? Well, it's interesting, like my quote that I wanted to give is that, you know, first responders, and I would say medical providers, we clean up messes, right? We clean up all the messes that, that come our way. First responders do as well. And my quote was that nothing ever gets clean without something else becoming dirty. And I think that, um, that the importance of a law like this is that if we don't start helping the people that are cleaning up the messes, we're going to end up in a big mess ourselves. I mean, like, we, we have to pay attention to the people who are becoming dirty from the messes that they're cleaning up. So I, I mean, I think that that's larger than the scope of this particular uh, bill, but, um, but we do have to pay attention to the people who are, are, um, are cleaning up the messes or we won't have any of the sphere is the most important thing we have in our communities today. I, I think 
having now personally spent time with 2,137 first responders, I can say that you feel it. I mean, you feel it. Um, and with COVID, it's become um, a, a particularly um, heavier burden on the people that I work with and the people that I work for and with. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting point that you made. Well, thank you, Dr. Morris. And uh, if, if you don't mind, could you find a, a better place to speak? Because you were going in and out. You've, you've got Sorry. one spot that you're a lot louder. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. I sit like this in front of my microphone. Yeah, I was going to say your mic seems to be cutting, ebbing in and yeah. out. Just be careful with that. Um, I have Representative Bradstreet next. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for being here, Dr. Morris. I appreciate thank it. You. Glad you finally got in. Uh, we heard earlier about, uh, I think somebody testified that uh, treated uh, PTSD people uh, can go back to work and they can be treated. In your professional opinion, uh, with the proper treatment of PTSD, can most people go back to work at the uh, original uh, jobs that they had? Yes, one of my statistics I didn't get to, you know, asking a psychiatrist to, um, to speak for three minutes is like dressing a squirrel. Um, one of the statistics I had that I didn't get to um, is that at, at our center, when people answer our, we follow people for 18 months. And uh, in, in our statistics um, here from our center, 60% of people at, at least at one month and at three months um, have returned back to work after treatment for PTSD, at a full, full duty, full duty. And um, uh, I think is 11% more to at least partial duty. And I think it was 7% more had already come to us at retirement. So that's a good significant amount who have returned. So it is treatable. And one of the things, again, and it was in my talk that I didn't get to is um, majority, if not all of our patients, they, they don't want to leave their job. They, they love their jobs. It's, it's, it's more than a job. It's more than a career to them. It's their identity. It's, it's a purpose. These are incredibly purposeful human beings. It's, it's everything that they want. It's everything in their lives. It's their social world. It's their brotherhood. It's their, they spend more time at their stations oftentimes, unfortunately, than they do at their homes. And so it's not that they're trying to find excuses to leave their jobs. It's what they, it's what they come here to do is to go back to work. So what they want is they want us to fix them so they can go back and get broken again. Do I have any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time. I'm glad we were able to get you in, Dr. Morris. Sorry um, about all the complications. No worries. It's part of the uh, curse of virtual legislature, but also the blessing that we can have people you know, safely and from all over the state and country. With that, we're going to skip back to those testifying against. I have Elizabeth Brogan with us. The floor is yours. Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Elizabeth Brogan. I'm the Executive Director of the Workers' Compensation Coordinating Council and Main Council of Self-Insurers. Uh, Director Rohde has submitted a report showing an increase in claims, but no increase in claim costs. The report does show, however, a significant jump in costs to the state and municipalities described as the equivalent of insurance premiums. As noted in the last paragraph of the report before the conclusion section, Maine Municipal Association reports that member contributions to its self-insurance trust fund increased by about 1.8 million for the most recent three-year period. These increases were borne by mostly by entities that have been paying PTSD-related claims. The gap between claims costs and member contributions exists because premiums or self-insurance member contributions, that is towns and cities funded by their taxpayers are based on the projected full cost of a claim, not a snapshot of early costs. Many mental injuries are gradual in nature, but the report does not look at the ultimate settlement value of these cases, which may be years down the road. The discrepancy between, between claim costs and projected costs suggests the period of study was not long enough as previously pointed out and the data insufficient. As acknowledged by Director Rohde in his presentation of the report to this committee, some of the cases looked at may still be in litigation and that process was likely slowed by the pandemic. 
Um, if you look at the report, I think it's page six, page six and seven, it shows decrees and lump sum settlement values in the various years. There was just one of each in 2020. There were none in 2021. So I would suggest that yes, that is an impact of the pandemic. Um, and those numbers will change. Also, there were two new categories as noted of employees, the 911 dispatchers and correctional officers, which were added uh, just this past October and therefore not included at all. Um, for this reason, and because of the data and the timing issues that we've been discussing, the sunset set should not be repealed, but rather extended out um, for all groups of employees for a period of time sufficient to provide a more complete picture of the impact. For these reasons, I urge the committee to vote, vote ought not to pass on LD 1879. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Thank you so much. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Yes, Representative Cuddy. Ms. Brogan, I'm, uh, thank you for being here. And I, I apologize for asking this of you because I it, it was really a question for Ms. Dufour, but by the time it sort of came to mind, um, she had uh, she was no longer here testifying. Perhaps if, if she's around for the work session, I'll be able to ask her directly. But MMA had suggested two things, one of which was um, trying to address some of the underlying causes. And the underlying causes to me seem to be the work itself that the people are doing. So I, I am unclear on how we could change the nature of what first responders do that would be helpful to that. Is this something that your uh, organization has any uh, take on? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what she was referring to by underlying causes, except that I, I have heard that it is an issue getting actual a sufficient number of providers of mental health providers. So that may be one of the underlying problems referred to getting getting that prompt treatment. Just a, a follow up, or actually not a follow up, but a separate question. Go right ahead. Thank you, Senator. Um, thank you for that. And um, so regarding um, the idea of pushing the sunset back as opposed, um, you, you have, you've stated that there's a difference between premiums and payouts and, and that was where your, um, uh, uh, that at one point, I think it was a $1.8 million figure. I, I took that from the report. Yes. Okay. Um, and that was, as I understand it from the report, that was over a three year period. That wasn't a single year or was it a single year? I, that's why I put it in quotes in my testimony. Um, that's, okay. that's taken right from the report. I don't think it's as clear possibly as it could be. I think it's probably over a three year period, but again, um, in my written testimony, I have that in quotes. That, I'm right. assuming it's over three years. Um, but, and you stated in your testimony that this came from districts that were primarily paying out the PTSD, but I mean, you may have a, a coexistence of these two things, but they are not necessarily co-related. Uh, yeah, and again, exactly. again, that's a direct quote from the report. I think the report raises some questions. I can't answer those. I wasn't part of the group looking at the data. Um, I'm hopefully you have John Rohde here to testify further. Um, I had nothing to do with writing the report. So again, I put that as a direct quote um, that it, it was coincidental, not necessarily causative. I can't, I can't say that, but it was coincidental that it was the very same towns paying these very expensive claims that had the higher premiums. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Do I have any further questions from the committee at this time? Oh, yes, no. It's got, okay, there we go, now we're good. I do believe you're off the hook, Ms. Bergen. Uh, oh. Thank you for your time and your testimony this afternoon. Thank you. Now, um, before we move on to our next category, is there anyone left present in the waiting room who had intended to testify against this measure? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing none, now we're gonna move on to those wishing to testify neither for nor against. Um, we have up first, um, John Rode. Please let me know if I'm missaying your name. And by, after that, we have Mallory Shaughnessy. Um. 
Good afternoon, Senator Daughtry, and Representative Sylvester, and members of the Labor uh, and Housing Committee. I'm John Rohde. I have a long E on the end, but you were very close in your pronunciation. Uh, and I am the Executive Director of the Workers' Compensation Board. Uh, as you'll see from my written testimony, on behalf of the board itself, I am here to testify neither for nor against LD 1897. Unlike most times when I do this, I did, as you know, give a report a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it's been some discussion about it. So. Uh, I will try to blaze through some of this within the three minute uh, category here. In terms of costs, what's in the report, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the costs reported to the board, and I apologize if it's not clear from the report itself, is just what has been reported for actual payouts on these cases. I believe Ms. Dufour is talking about what an actuary might decide is the ultimate impact of uh, a law change, if you will, on costs to the uh, entities who are involved in it. But we did have representatives from the Maine Municipal Association on the committee, including somebody from the Risk Management uh, Division. Um, I lost some of Ms. Brogan's testimony was, as I was being led into the uh, group here, but she did point to, on page nine, we asked MMA for their costs associated with this bill, getting to her point of what is the impact from a I use the word premium because that's how we think about it with insurance companies, but it's, I guess it's called a contribution. And again, I apologize if it's not, if it's not clear and obviously it's not because people are questioning it, but that 1.8 is attributable to the um, PTSD bill. That's what we were told once it was enacted. These were the costs that they had seen from a premium perspective. The board doesn't gather that information. Uh, so we couldn't tell you what it is. Uh, all we can tell you is what's reported uh, as payouts to the employee or perhaps uh, medical providers and the like. We also don't do actuarial analyses in terms of saying, well, here's what you have. We will develop it, develop it to ultimate, if you will. Um, we did also meet, um, well, I know Senator Guerin had asked a similar type question about the length of time and Ms. Brogan referred to this as well. There are nine cases still pending before the board at formal hearing, seven of those and two at mediation. Uh, most of them are from 20 and 21. I think one is from 2018. And it does take time for a case to go from beginning to end. It has taken longer because of the pandemic. Um, Representative Gear had wondered about the experiences of people sort of on the ground. So last week, uh, some folks here at the board uh, and I met with uh, Mr. Kraus, Mr. Gaspar, um, a representative from MMA, uh, Ms. Davenport Dakin was there, a uh, representative from uh, DAFS was there from, on behalf of the state. And there's certainly an effort on both sides to address the early intervention. Uh, you can't prevent one of these injuries necessarily from occurring, uh, to your point, Representative Cuddy, because they're responding to something somebody else has done, uh, if that's the cause of the trauma. But the early intervention strategies are there. Um, municipalities are doing some, the professional associations are doing some, uh, and the hope there is that even though you have, you may have more claims, but ultimately what you're hoping is that the cost of each claim isn't as large. And I believe I'm down to about 15 seconds. So with that, I'll conclude by saying, if you have any questions, uh, happy to address them today if I can, or uh, later if, if need be. Thank you, Mr. Rohde, and thanks for the correction on your name. Uh, Representative Cuddy. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Director Rohde, for being here today. Um, so the, the, question, the question has been raised as to whether or not the, the chart, particularly on page nine, um, is a valid comparison. And I wanted to get your take on whether you think the comparison um, is valid and actually demonstrates what you believe it, it what you what your report says it uh, it does demonstrate. Yeah, so I hope not to overcomplicate it, but the report again is just a snapshot in time. And I think we discussed a couple of weeks ago, those numbers will definitely change over time. I would expect to see the numbers from 20 and 21 to increase some. Uh, I don't have any issue with the, the point that yes, over time cases can, uh, costs can add up in a particular case. That's why we had two sections and we did ask the MMA to provide the information about impact to its municipalities in the premium, if you will, uh, aspect. And that's where that 1.8 figure came from. So you're seeing what 
um, is reported to the board as a snapshot in time from last fall. That, those numbers will change over time, certainly for the more recent cases. And you also have a section addressing the point of what might the cost impact be uh, actually to the municipalities, because they're right when the law was passed, they had to figure out some way to determine what their members would pay for their coverage. And that's the number you're seeing in section B on page nine, the, uh, the $1.8 million figure. And this is where I will risk overcomplicating things. The issue of the cost of PTSD, right, is these are all experiences that have happened since the law passed in 2017, which you're seeing uh, here. Um, so uh, that's all it really did is take a, a quick look in time at what we got. We asked them for their information about what the impact was to their members on the premium side. And that's the, those are the two figures uh, you've seen there. Uh, and it has it's been mentioned a couple of times, this does not include corrections officers or E911 dispatchers because they were added just a, a few months ago. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Roby. You're welcome. Thank you. So we had um, Mallory Shaughnessy signed up to testify another for nor against, but I am not seeing her in the attendees portion. Um, is there anyone else present who an intended to testify neither for nor against? Seeing none, um, any questions from the committee for our OPLA analysts for Stephen to gather up for us before the work session? Seeing none, I'm going to officially close the hearing on LD 1879. I know we are very much past and sneaking into the lunch hour here with our public hearings, but I would beg, uh, of our committee members to stick with it. We have one last public hearing and then we can take a break for lunch after that. And uh, the good house minority leader has been waiting patiently to present her bill. So I wanna make sure we bring her in and open the public hearing on LD 1881 and act to clarify the laws related to the use of medical marijuana and workers' compensation. And we have good representative Dillingham here to present the bill. Let's make sure that we get her point. Ported over, uh, ported over. Should be coming through. There we go. And I see Representative Dillingham has been able to join us. Thank you for your patience. And the floor is finally yours. No, oh, thank you for your patience and, and working with me between uh, uh, Veterans and Legal Affairs and my public hearing there. I truly appreciate it. And especially for sticking with me when you've had such a long day already. So good afternoon, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing. I'm Kathleen Dillingham, and I represent the towns of Mechanic Falls, Otisfield, and Oxford in Western Maine. I come before you today to present LD 1881, an act to clarify the laws related to the use of medical marijuana and workers' compensation. I share the following as an explanation for the impetus for my bill submission. In 2008, a longtime friend of mine sustained life-threatening injuries via a workplace logging accident. Though medically he was considered to have recovered after many months and operations, he was left permanently impaired and in constant pain from the injuries sustained. He was actively trying to settle a worker's compensation claim against his employer um, when he took his own life in 2014. The resulting disabilities from his injuries and pain prevented him from ever being able to return to logging, a work that he loved. It impacted every day of his life. To manage his pain, he was prescribed pain medications. We talked several times over the years how he disliked being reliant on the pills to manage his pain. While trying to gather more information after speaking with individuals that were concerned with my bill proposal, I recently spoke with his brother again, who shared with me that at one point he became addicted to the prescription pain medications and tried to stop using them in an attempt to break his addiction. I wasn't aware that he had become addicted to the prescription medications, but he and I had talked many times about the prescriptions and that he didn't like how they made him feel and he felt the side effects outweighed the benefits of the use. I remember asking him about using marijuana because I knew some cancer patients at the time had found benefits of its use, but he told me that he was advised that he could not use marijuana or its byproducts because of the company he worked for chose to drug test them that could be used to deny his settlement. His brother also confirmed that he was told the same. I don't know if my friend was advised not to use marijuana, marijuana by a lawyer or a worker advocate. 
I don't know if the company he was working for filed a notice of controversy, and that is why he was not receiving payments for lost time, lost wages, medical bills, and medical treatments. I don't know why his workers' compensation case was never settled. I'm not here today to try to answer any of those questions. I'm also not here to determine if my friend took his life because he could no longer deal with the constant pain, or if it was because of the suicidal side effects some patients experience with the use of prescription pain medications, or if it was because of other personal experiences in his life. Knowing the answers now will not change the outcome or let him know how much he mattered in our lives. I'm here in hopes to address if an employee is involved in a workplace accident and that individual chooses to use cannabis or as byproducts to manage pain versus prescription pain medications, that cannot be used as a determining factor to deny workers' compensation benefits or a workers' compensation settlement by the employer. I've been told that it is believed to be permissible for employees to use cannabis in the manner I have stated. If that is the case, that I would ask that it clearly be stated in 39-A, workers' compensation. I'm not suggesting that employers must pay for the use of medical marijuana by an employee that chooses to use cannabis to treat pain or injury related to workplace incident under the request for payment of medical treatments. I'm not trying to address any workplace policies that prevent the use of marijuana or requires that an employee not be impaired from use of marijuana by an employee that has returned to work under full work capacity or restricted workload. And I'm not asking that this be applied to those employers that must participate in random drug testing of employees per federal requirements. I've attended community meetings and listened to many debates pertaining to the opioid ep epidemic that we face. Often we are discussing items to treat post addiction. I continually ask what we can do to prevent addiction. I see this as one small step. Maine experienced 636 overdose deaths in 2021, a 23% increase over 2020. If we can allow the use of cannabis versus highly addictive opioids in incidents of workplace injuries while the employee is recovering without the employee having to be concerned that the use can be used as a basis to deny benefits and or a settlement by the employer, we should make that very clear in statute. I thank you for your time and consideration today, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you may have for me. Thank you, Representative Dillingham, for your testimony. Um, I do want to make a quick interruption before we move on to questions to let the members of this committee, as well as the entire legislative family know. Um, it is with deep, con a very broken heart and a lot of sorrow, I wanna let everyone know that Representative Donna Dorr passed away this morning. Um, she fought very hard. Um, I also, um, for those who did see me crying earlier on camera, I just wanted to share that we were waiting until it was made public with her family. Um, the speaker's office has sent out more information, but um, I'd be remiss without saying that the legislature lost a very wonderful, wonderful woman and our family grieves. And I would ask, um, for all of us, if we could just take a moment of silence in her memory and same for Representative Tuttle, whom we also lost this week. So just a brief moment of silence. And with that, um, if anyone does need to take some time, please let me know. Um, I know we're all in this together and Sorry, Representative Dillingham, uh, we've had a lot of uh, very intense bills this morning and I know this doesn't help either and just know that we're all in it together. So if anyone needs anything, please, please let me know. Um, with that Madam, being said, Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Sylvester. With, with the leave of the sponsor, I'm wondering if we could grab a couple minutes. Um, I would appreciate I, that as well wholeheartedly agree and say that I would appreciate that as well. So if it's all right with the committee, let's all take 15 minutes and circle back. If anyone needs more time, um, please let me know and hang in there.
I know that we're waiting for everyone to come back, but I do want to want to say that this is one of those times we're not being um, in the cross building in the committee room. This is one of those times where I'm really, really hating that. Agreed, Representative Cuddy. I think we're going to wait a second to get everyone back on camera and thank you, Representative Sylvester, for, um, for asking for us to take a moment. And I know it's going to be process for all of us. So. Now they'd be telling me, get back to work, Mike. Yep. There's stuff to do. <laughs> exactly what I was just thinking. Uh, so in her honor, let's jump right back in. I do believe uh, Representative Dillingham, we just finished uh, with um, your testimony. I think uh, Representative Sylvester, you had a question if I remember correctly. That is correct, Madam Chair. Thank you uh, for bringing forward this bill, Representative Dillingham. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to clear up what I thought might be some of the um, confusion that might come later on in testimony by asking a couple of simple questions. This is clarifying that after you are injured, you are allowed to use medical marijuana without it um, posing a challenge to your claim. Correct? Correct. Correct. It doesn't say that any employer has to allow you to use medical marijuana at work if it is against no. their policies or if it would put anybody in danger. Correct. 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 And, and just to clarify, um, it doesn't come under medication uh, that would be, that would be, you know, um, covered under workman's comps costs. Um, it just allows for the period between the time when that somebody is injured and the time when their case is settled that in their own home, they can use their, or, you know, wherever they can use medical marijuana. Correct. Correct. And I should have had you present my testimony for me. <laughs> this is my role, Representative Dillingham. I try to cut to the chase. So uh, I appreciate you putting in the bill and uh, hopefully that'll save us a lot of uh, round the barn questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sylvester. Uh, Representative Warren. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for your testimony and for bringing this bill forward, Representative Dillingham. I just, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I hope this is appropriate. I just wanted to say that I'm so sorry for your loss, and um, thank you very much for sharing your this story. And um, I hope that good comes from um, your your doing so. I'm just very moved by that story. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Warren. I do appreciate that. Um, as you can see, there's been a gap of time um, since it's happened. It's taken me a long time, um, eight years serving in the legislature um, to get to the point to approach the family and have the discussion. Um, and even seeing it in black and white, um, having to allude to the reason why I brought the bill forward um, is still difficult at times. And I'd like to say that I could be a professional at all times and focus clearly just on policy in black and white, but um, that always isn't the case. And this happens to be probably the hardest bill I have um, ever had to present. So I appreciate and uh, certainly made more difficult by um, the very sad news about Representative Dorr. So thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Representative Warren. Um, do we have any other questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, thank you, Representative Dillingham. Echo thank you. a lot of what Representative Warren said as well. And um, we will now, I don't think we have any other legislators present. Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, it took me a minute to get back. I, I appreciate um, the opportunity to just, just say a word to Representative Dillingham. Um, because I was moved by her testimony and then I had to take a break for the other news. And I just want to say, Representative, I really appreciate you going through this process. It is always difficult to lose a friend, but certainly to suicide. 
um, we don't talk about that very much at all. And I have certainly lost a share uh, for that reason. And so I appreciate you bringing this to us at this time. And it is, I should also say <laughs> that Representative Donna Dore, workers' compensation issues around this issue were at the top of her concerns in the legislature. So as odd as it sounds, it seems serendipitous and appropriate that we would get the news about her passing in the presentation of the bill. So thank you for bringing it forward. And thank you, Senator Hickman, for, for your comments as well. I, mean, I do appreciate it. And I always enjoy working with you. Thank you, Senator Hickman. Um, trying to get back on track because you're totally right, Representative Sylvester. Donna would tell us to do exactly that with a smile. Um, I do believe we're going to switch now to uh, da, 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 trying to pull up all the right people. I think, do we have anyone present speaking for the bill? Justin, please let me know if I've skipped over anybody. Oh, rip. We have Paul McCarrier joining us. Let me make sure I can switch him over. Promoting you to panelist. I'm sorry, I just did a uh, shared daughtery, just so you know. No worries. I thought I did it earlier, but I guess I didn't. My apologies. We're, we're, all, we're all working together. We'll get there. <laughs> okay, Paul, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, my name is Paul T. McCarrier. Um, I own a cannabis business, uh, a small farm and a property management business, all located in Waldo County. I employ a total of nine people and I'm here today to speak in favor of the uh, bill to allow uh, workers compensation um, people to be able to use medical cannabis. Um, I've known Donna for 11 years, so pardon me for my testimony being a little um, convoluted. First and foremost, I think it's most important that um, when we talk about this is that cannabis is legal in the state of Maine, both for medical and adult use. And this is about patient choice. If a patient believes that cannabis will help them with their injury that they've received in the workplace and they have a medical professional that agrees with them, I think the legislature should uh, take an affirmative stance and support that. Oftentimes we've seen that advice <clears throat> and prescriptions, um, specifically narcotics, can have a um, very detrimental effect on people's lives. And so if people wanna choose a healthy, healthier alternative, a natural an alternative, and more importantly, an alternative that they can grow and produce themselves, I think the legislature should support that. As uh, Representative Dillingham has brought up, this will simply clarify the law. I think that, again, this is an important role of the legislature to clarify that medical cannabis is an appropriate use to use for pain, for stress, anxiety, and for other medical issues. Um, and if someone is especially hurt in the workplace, I think you've heard about, you know, a bill earlier talking about post-traumatic stress disorder from the workplace. Um, if that is the case, then I think the, if a medical provider agrees that a person should be able to decide to use that. Very importantly too, is this could be an important step to prevent potential addiction and overdose when using um, pharmaceuticals and narcotics. Our state has a big issue with drug addiction and people more often than not, I think a majority of the time will get addicted to um, opioids and you know the feeling of them through a legal prescription and then we'll turn to the black market so if we can prevent that in the first place by allowing them to use cannabis in a therapeutic way to deal with their workplace injury we should allow that i know people who have you have have used cannabis to help with workplace injuries i think it's really important that workers compensation covers that um, I also think workers' compensation should cover the cost of that. This is a healthier alternative to many pharmaceuticals out there. Uh, this is also um, non-physically addicting and is something that people can produce for themselves. And if you're talking about the idea of being a hardworking person and all of a sudden losing that part of your life because you are hurt on the job, 
um, losing that agency can have a very big effect on your mental health. And if people are allowed to use cannabis therapeutically for their workers' comp claims and be able to grow it themselves, that can help deal with that depression because that will give them a good sense of purpose and give them more agency over their lives. I employ nine people in Waldo County, and I would have no problem if any of them, you know, God willing, they don't, but if any of them ever got hurt on the job, I would have no problem with them using cannabis as a way to treat that injury. Um, I hope the legislature would support me, and I hope that the legislature would, would support any worker who is employed in this state for having the choice to use cannabis if they and their medical provider thought that was appropriate. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I have questions from Representative Br uh, Bradstreet, followed by Representative Prescott, and followed by Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. McCary, for being here. I think you just stated that it's, it's not physically addictive. Uh, it, is not, it is not physically addictive. Okay, are there any longitudinal studies to, to back that up that you know of? I, I know quite a few people who use it, so I, I'm just wondering. Yes, so the idea that it, you will not suffer from physical withdrawal symptoms like you would from caffeine, like you would from um, almost every pharmaceutical drug, um, or you would from alcohol. And I think it's really important to bring up that a lot of people who are dealing with pain issues and a lot of people who have had issues um, with injuries um, tend to turn to alcohol because it's a, it's a legal alternative and it's very accessible. Um, and that is the biggest danger that I've seen is that people are turning to alcohol um, to treat their pain issues as opposed to turning to something else. That being said, it does have um, potentially emotional and mental addictions, but that is something that is much more treatable and is much more able to deal with than um, any sort of physical addiction. And if we're talking about the idea of people having to deal with those, them being able to produce the cannabis themselves will and also enable them to be able to have more control over how much they're consuming. Thank you. I have a question from Representative, uh, Representative Prescott followed by Representative Warren. All right, thank you. Uh, how will this reflect with federal law? I, I'm not an attorney, so um, I believe workers' compensation has been um, allowed to the states, um, just like our elections and such. So that is, as far as my understanding, is that I don't know if that would affect um, any sort of federal law. If it comes down to um, like commercial driver's licenses and other things that are in the federal sphere, uh, I think that's a question that maybe could be dealt with in the work session. All right, thanks. We'll get some info from our analysts, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Warren. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for uh, being here today, sir. I hope you'll forgive me. I'm not gonna ask you too much about, um, I guess the, the medical components of this because with all due respect, I think you're here in your capacity as a small business owner and um, I really appreciate that. And so um, what I wanna ask you about is the, um, for one, your, your industry. Um, can you speak at all to, my understanding is it's a growing industry and it seems like one that could be very important for a variety of reasons um, to the more rural parts of our state, which are the majority of our state and perhaps where we should in part be focusing. So if I could have you uh, speak to that and then maybe as well, um, if you have any personal experience with um, any uh, clients or um, you, you mentioned your position on uh, supporting your, your workers if they, if they wanted to use this or that substance um, in, uh, I guess assisting them, um, if you could speak at all to the to the stigma that's uh, kind of part of, unfortunately, um, in, in my view, uh, part of where you're where we're at with um, marijuana. So, could you talk about maybe this uh, piece of legislation could be part of uh, breaking down that stigma and, as well, maybe creating good um, economic opportunity for more of our rural agricult agricultural industries. Well, you definitely hit on the right point with uh, rural agricultural industries. I think that's, um, that's something that we could definitely help. But when we're talking about breaking down the stigma is that people need to be able to um, talk openly about how, you know, how they're dealing with pain, how they're dealing with you know, mental, physical, emotional issues, and cannabis needs to be a part of that conversation. And I think um, speaking to, I think what Representative Bradstreet was talking about earlier with addiction is that if someone is using cannabis too much, if they can't openly talk about it, then they're not going to be able to have it be, be able to be addressed by their church, their family, their community, their workplace. Um, I think that from my standpoint, I, 
as a store operator from dealing with thousands of patients over the past few years is that we see a lot of people who are using this as a way to um, to deal with, you know, whatever workplace injury they have. Um, recently, there was somebody who um, was diagnosed with cancer and they worked in a field where there is a high level of cancer because you're dealing with fuels and solvents and exhaust and such. Um, thankfully, because of immunotherapy and pharmaceuticals, and um, I think they're moving on to chemotherapy radiation right now, they, um, they've had a tumor that has been significantly reduced, um, but it was their use of cannabis that helped continue to let them keep their quality of life. It is the cannabis that um, has also allowed them to return to their job. So this is an example of somebody who did not use workers' compensation as a lifetime crutch, but as somebody who needed it as a bridge for when they're receiving treatments and as they're continuing to receive treatments, but they wanted to return to work. And that is the thing that I see most commonly with people who are using cannabis to treat workplace injuries is that they want to return to work. They are not using this as a, as a, as a way to not work. They receive fulfillment out of working and they wanna continue doing that. Um, my phone was ringing a couple times, so I apologize. I missed the first first question. So if you could just repeat that for me, I'll do my best to answer. No, I think you you actually I think respond to some of my points. I, I share your feeling that there's a tremendous amount of dignity in work and wanting to just make sure that people have the opportunity to do what they need to do to return to that good worthy work. So thank you. And, and I think I think at the same time that you know as 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 you brought up with the dignity of work is that cannabis will empower people. It empowers people to return to work. And that is something that I have not seen with pharmaceuticals. I've seen with especially narcotics and opioids, they tend to drag you down and make you more complacent. Well, with cannabis, it tends to stimulate your mind more. It tends to make it where you're gonna to wanna to return to work. You're gonna to wanna to be there. And um, that's, that's my personal experience. I, I grew up here in Belfast. I've, I've lived in Waldo County most of my life and um, people wanna work. They, they, they want to be able to go out there and do that. Um, and I feel like this bill, um, if passed, could help more people return to work because cannabis will only be a bridge for them to return to work as opposed to being a lifetime um, therapeutic use. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony this afternoon. And um, do we have anyone else who's here to testify in favor of this bill? I don't have anyone else on my list. Justin, do you have anyone else? No, we do not. So if you're in the waiting room and you want to testify in favor, please raise your hand. But seeing none, um, let's move to uh, those testifying against. Up first, I have Elizabeth Brogan, followed by Bruce Garrity, followed by Bruce, you're on here twice. So I guess we just have two folks. We have Elizabeth Brogan, followed by Oh, we have one hand up from Tony Payne. Let me just switch Tony over to see if Tony was here to testify in support. Tony, were you here to testify in support of this bill? Or was this a accidental hand raise? No, I am. Uh, I, I was trying to get into the uh, testifying in opposition. Opposition. Line. Absolutely. No worry. So then we will move on to Elizabeth Brogan. Um, let me switch Elizabeth over, followed by Bruce Garrity. Elizabeth, we are porting you through the Alice in Wonderland tunnel hole right now. And Elizabeth, the floor is yours. There you go. Now we can see Elizabeth. We just can't hear you. You're still on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and members of the Joint Committee on Labor and Housing. My name is Elizabeth Brogan. I'm the executive director of the Workers' Compensation Coordinating Council and Maine Council of Self-Insurers. The Maine Medical Use of Marijuana Act strikes a balance between protecting an authorized user of medical marijuana, stating they may not be denied any right or privilege, 
while imposing reasonable limits on the right to use medical marijuana in the workplace or in other circumstances which would pose a threat to public safety. So it is a fact in the law that employers may legally prohibit medical marijuana in the workplace and may prohibit working while under the influence of medical marijuana. To prohibit acknowledgement of this reality in workers' compensation agreements does not serve anyone. There are circumstances in which an agreement under the Workers' Comp Act might be contingent upon an employee being able to return to the workplace without being under the influence of marijuana. If this bill were to become law, an employer might be prohibited from resolving a case with a return to work, something generally desired by all parties, if the employee is using medical marijuana. Even if medical marijuana use could be accommodated, and sometimes it is, this bill would not allow the parameters of that use to be made clear in agreement. If an employer were induced to return an employee to work without asking about the use of medical marijuana, that could jeopardize the safety of the employee and other workers or the public at large, a result the Marijuana Act sought to avoid. If a worker's compensation case is not resolved by agreement, but rather through litigation, this bill would prohibit a judge from seeing any evidence of medical marijuana use, regardless of its relevance to a range of issues, which could include work capacity, causation, the reasonableness of other medications, which might be contraindicated with marijuana use or return to work issues. This could result in decisions that are unfair to either or both parties. It should also be noted that workers' compensation board judges are uniquely qualified to sift through evidence in a workers' comp case. They know what's relevant and have the authority to exclude that which is not. To deny these judges the ability to consider all relevant evidence, including medical evidence, because we're considering medical marijuana here, does not serve the best interests of anyone in the workers' compensation system. For these reasons, I urge the committee to vote ought not to pass on LD 1881, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the committee? Seeing, oh yes, Representative Sylvester. Sorry, I couldn't find my button. Uh, welcome again, Ms. Brogan. So uh, were you here when Representative Dillingham and I were, were chatting? Because I asked her directly whether or not this would in any way limit uh, an employer about on work up to, to do set rules regarding work time. Or were we just talking about the period in which a worker was unable to report to work? Um, and she said that this did not in any way limit an employer's rights to set rules about the use of marijuana at work or to, um, you know, to set, you know, that, that it was during that period between injury and return to work. And so I just wanted to see if you heard that. I did hear that. Um, I mean, I, I agree heard the language say, might not quite say that, but I, but I, but I, yeah, I heard that. And I, I, I understand that she's not looking to change that uh, that uh, statement in the law that employer that it that the law can't be construed to um, to force employers to allow medical marijuana use. Um, however, I think the bill would um, it would limit the the rights of employers to do just that thing in the case of a workers' comp injury or alleged injury. I mean, I don't see any way. I don't see any way around that. I mean, I know she says that's not what she's doing, but I think the result would be that employers would be in a position where they couldn't say offer a return to work contingent on, you know, being able to pass a drug test. They're allowed to have those drug tests. So what would they do? Would they have to say, well, let's just let it slide in this one case because there's a workers' comp injury involved? I mean, I, do you, see, do you see what I what I mean? Uh, you know, I, I I see what you mean, and I but I think I'm going to try to cram two questions into my follow up here so that uh, so that I don't have to ask for a third. Um, so in the situation where any medicine was being any pharmaceutical was being used that reduced capacity, um, employers are able to say that you cannot use this while at work mm -hmm. um, if it diminishes your capacity. Yep. Right, and so if that medicine is required in order for them to be able to return to work, 
then we end up in one of those situations where either um, an employer would have to find some lighter duty or, mm -hmm. um, or the, the employee would have to reject the return to work um, if they yeah. were unable to work without the use of the pharmaceuticals. And so by putting it in the terms of pharmaceuticals, I think it makes a lot more sense what we're talking about here, because if someone can't return to work without the use of medical marijuana, then the employer has the right to say that they are not, that they are not able to perform the function of their job. It's not suitable work. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's and, the, right. and the employee would be able then be able to say, I can't return to work without the use of these pharmaceuticals. And then that becomes a whole different situation in terms of their uh, refusal of, of return to work. And I think so, the employee could do that in, with the, in the case of medical marijuana as well. Absolutely. And there so, isn't a so problem. But yeah. whether they take that, whether they take that pharmaceutical or medical marijuana after hours in their own home is their own business. And that's what this law, I think, is trying to say. I, and, I, and I think that's I think that's the case now. Um, but there are some circumstances. I mean, it sounds as though the, in the case that that she was referring to, um, perhaps there was a, there was drug testing, weekly drug testing. Or, or something like that. I mean, there are circumstances in which, um, you know, probably an employer doesn't care what you do on your own time. But there are, you know, jobs where you're handling heavy machinery, say, and you, and so you can't have any drugs in your system. Absolutely. We agree on that. And so I won't ask a third question. But I'll <laughs> let my colleagues go. You represented Sylvester. I have Senator Hickman followed by Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Brogan, my question is simple. Do you think that it is fair for a person to exercise their right to use medical marijuana being denied workers' compensation for that reason and that reason alone? Well, I, I, I guess I'm going to take a exception to the premise because I'm not sure that that happened. It has happened. And I'm asking you the question because I know that it has happened. It's happened more than once, and I have evidence of that. So I'm just going to ask the question straightforward. Do you think that's okay? It doesn't sound okay, but I Perfect. would want to see, a, you know, an incident in which that happened and the benefits were denied because of the use of medical marijuana. Because, again, I would like to see that, but I can't Thank think you. of a circumstance in which it would happen. Thank you. I have Representative Warren next. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your testimony. We were talking a bit earlier um, about the role of stigma, and I'm wondering if you could speak at all in your perspective to the to the um, maybe to why or in 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 what understanding you have that um, marijuana should be treated differently than these other um, prescription medications. Um, it sounds to me like I'm hearing both from you that this is already legal. And so this bill is unnecessary, but also that maybe marijuana should be treated in a discriminatory manner. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could speak to that because maybe I'm confused by your uh, testimony. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm saying it should be treated differently. I mean, it, it isn't, it's treated differently in that it does not have to be paid for. And the law court decided that case several years ago. If you, and I, I gave you the site to that in my written testimony. Um, but because it is illegal federally, the law court determined that insurers cannot um, be forced to pay for something that's federally illegal. Um, I, I would say, you know, at that before that case, there may have been some stigma uh, attached to medical marijuana. I don't really think there is. This really isn't an issue I ever hear about. Um, you know, I think it's less expensive and less addictive. So, you know, there may be a situation where an employer agrees that it's the best thing, but they, they, they're not having to pay for it because it's, a, it's illegal under the federal law, whether we agree with that or not, it is. Um, and employers do have the right, really the obligation to have a safe workplace. So in that sense, it doesn't matter what the drug is, they, they can say, we don't want you using it here, and we don't want you under the influence here. If I could ask a, a follow-up question. 
Yes. That last statement that you made that, that the employer has certain rights um, about approving or, or disproving the being able to return to work in a full or limited capacity with a certain drug. It's not my understanding. I'm sorry, you keep that out. this piece of legislation is doing that. Uh, it's not my understanding that this legislation is um, saying, you know, carte blanche, you can use marijuana and, and there's no employer that has a say. That's not my understanding. Of well, this, so that's this where is, I'm confused. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. a. I mean, I, I think it's a confusing bill. I mean, and I really spent a lot of time trying to parse through, but it does say you know, what, what it would add is that a decision lump sum settlement or agreement under the act may not prohibit an employee from determining, from seeking a determination of rights from engaging in conduct as a qualifying patient. Um, and I went round and round about that because there isn't anything in the workers' compact that does that. Um, but there are, you know, the word agreement there makes me think that what it could do is say, if some parties went into mediation and agreed to, well, let's resolve the case, we'll pay you a, a short-term period of workers' comp, come back, we can accommodate you in this light duty job. Um, but let's say the employee knows that he's using medical marijuana, but that, that will not be tolerated at that workplace. Let's say there's heavy machinery around and he knows there's drug testing. In that situation, it seems to me that the way the bill is written, there, there couldn't be an agreement that spells out the parameters of that, that say, you know, you can't, you can't use, um, you can return to work, but you can't use the medical marijuana. So, I mean, given that that's the law, that that there are, you can have a marijuana-free drugs uh, work site, how are employers and employees going to go in and reach, and reach these agreements dealing with that issue? It seems to me it's just sort of masking the issue and saying, well, you can't talk about it and the judge can't look at evidence of it. I just feel I have a very different understanding of what the language of this bill is and I'm not clear I am following your uh, interpretation of this legislation as proposed. And additionally, I guess I feel concerned about the the way that some of the framing in your testimony has seemed to imply that those who rely on the use of medical marijuana would be dishonest or not seek to do their job um, and, and work with their employer, uh, just like someone using any other substance. So it, it sounds like from what you're saying, that would be illegal and that's not something we're proposing to change being dishonest about um, their uh, medical use it it sounds like you're making a set of assumptions that uh, Warren, I'm not sure part of this representative Warren I'm very sorry to cut you off but I want to be clear in the conduct of a public hearing we don't want to impugn someone's uh, motivations or questions if this is a chance for us to ask questions of those coming before us for more information for things that we can the things we might need clarity on and not about each other's um, potential feelings on an issue um, which we'll save for work session so I just want to remind the committee to try to keep that in mind to not we might not agree with someone who's coming before us but we need to make sure that we are respectful of them with our conduct and our comments but with that um, if you wanted to rephrase the question it, it does seem that there is a lot of work for our good analysts in trying to figure out where, you know, where this all fits. But I just want to, I know this can be an emotional subject for folks um, anytime we're dealing with workman's comp and just wanted to be clear about that. But with that, do you have sure. another question, Representative Warren or Rep uh, uh, Ms. Brogan? I don't know if you wanted to uh, respond to anything, but keeping it in a conduct of public hearing. I, I would just say, I, I'm not- I, I do apologize. It. I didn't mean to imply. I was <laughs> don't mean to disrespect if, if I did, I apologize. Thank you very much, Chairwoman, for, um, I, if I could raise, I my, I guess maybe my misunderstanding, um, or if I could ask you to clarify further on what you believe that those who may need to use marijuana would do that would be, that would become legal if this legislation were to pass. If, Again, if you could just clarify that, what is the, do you think that's what the law is 
we're trying to make law or you are concerned that people are going to further break the law? What I'm, what I'm doing is looking at this bill and trying to, set, to see how it will affect the law, the workers' compensation law. And so I'm looking at the words decision, lump sum settlement or agreement and limitations on them. I'm looking at the words um, ex shall exclude evidence and just telling you what I think the problems will be with that. Um, I'm not making any judgment on medical marijuana users or impugning anyone's honesty. I'm just telling you that I think it will cause problems in the system and what I, what I think those are. Uh, Representative Prescott. Well, hello. Hello. <laughs> so when somebody returns from workman's comp, a doctor has to sign off. And along with that, any prescriptions that they're gonna use to go to work would have to come through a doctor. That's right. And that doesn't matter whether it's any kind of pills or marijuana. So in that case, if a doctor signs off and says, all right, you can do these, what do they call it, tenure? You guys will have to help me out with all those marijuana terms. Uh, it would be, it would apply because the doctor knows this person going back to work. Is that right? The way workman's comp works? In any other manner besides marijuana, that's how workman comp works, right? Signed off by a doctor and prescribed by a doctor. Yeah. And there's a, there's a form at the workers' compensation board um, that for return to work and limitations that a doctor signs. Okay. So if we implemented this, that would go right along with that. If a doctor said, yeah, you can use marijuana, it would still go with the same process. Um, well, I mean, marijuana actually isn't prescribed. So it's in a little bit of a different situation. It's, um, there's a certification form, I think, and then it's dispensed. So it is a little bit different, but I haven't seen this, but, I, but usually a doctor will have a list of all medications and presumably that would now include medical marijuana and that would be considered by the doctor. I mean, this is part of my concern is that if you don't allow people to consider all the drugs that people, all the medications that people are using, including medical marijuana, the decision making gets a lot trickier, and that that actually harms the employee as well as the employer. Um, can I follow up? Yes. Sure. Sir. Somewhere along the line, somebody told me that because they had a medical marijuana card, when they went to a doctor, uh, they can't get issued opioids. Is that true? Um, I actually, I, I don't, I don't know if op opioids are contraindicated with, with medical marijuana. I mean, it, it may be, but I, I don't know that actually. All right. So if we, we put into this bill as prescribed by a doctor, even though I know you said it's not really prescribed now, but if we got a doctor to say, fine, would that help your cause? I don't think it really gets to the issues that I have with the language of this bill. Yeah, it's a little squirrely for me as well. Um, all right. Thank really, you let, me, let me recollect my thoughts here. Yeah, I mean, I'll get back. I mean, I, honestly, I could say whether whether it's prescribed or certified, the problem is that this bill would prevent judges from even knowing that medical marijuana is in use. And that could harm the employee in a number of ways. And again, like you're talking about opioids, and whether, um, you know, sometimes a judge has to decide whether medical treatment is reasonable. Well, what's, if- what section, of, what section of the bill are you reading that on that it, it would uh, block a judge from looking into this so I can reread it? That is the third part. If you look at the bottom, um, let's say section 539A MRSA, section 309 sub two, and then sub two is evidence. And it's added the language, the board or its designee shall exclude evidence of an employee engaging in conduct as a qualifying patient. So, so this could, you know, there are situations in which an employee might want to say, they offered me a job, but I can't do it because it involves driving a vehicle and I'm using medical marijuana. That employee would not be able to do that. And therefore a judge might have to conclude, well, they offered you a job, you don't get any benefits. So, I mean, that's just one example. 
in which it could hurt the employee to not be able to say, I'm using medical marijuana. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from the committee? Representative Sylvester? Just a reminder, I know there's a lot of um, different nuances. So we'll make sure we get as much information. And remember, committee members, if you have questions at the end that we didn't get, or if there's someone else we'd like to hear from at the work session, uh, make, we'll make sure we get all of that for everyone. Representative Sylvester? Thank you, Madam Chair. That is actually what I was going about to point out was to remind folks that we also have a series of work sessions this afternoon that we need to get through. And that if there are pieces of information that people want clarity from, they can also get that from the analyst. Absolutely. I was going to say, if you're one of those people like myself, that you'll be either cooking dinner or walking the dog at time very later and think of a question, you know, we're here to you know, go through our analyst and make sure we get those all answered. Um, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you so much for your time, Ms. Bergen. Um, up next, I do believe we have Bruce Garrity followed by Tony Payne. Uh, <clears throat> uh, can you hear me now? Oh, okay, I, I'm sitting so that the sun's in my back. I really have a hard time seeing uh, seeing your uh, thumb, Senator. You're all good. Uh, Floor is Senator uh, Dosh, Representative Sylvester, members of the committee, before I uh, make my comments, which I'll try to keep brief, I, um, I just wanted to reflect for just one moment on the passing of uh, Representative Doerr, whom I knew for almost 40 years from her days with the Secretary of State's office. And she was a she was a very nice person. She was a good representative. She was an ardent advocate and she's going to be missed. And uh, I also have to say, I was just as saddened with the passing of John Tuttle recently, who was a member of this committee going back to the 1980s. And, and he and I had the opportunity to work on legislation uh, going back that far. So I think the state has lost a couple of uh, very uh, valued um, people. Uh, in. In, uh, I'm testifying on behalf of the Maine Auto Dealers Association in relation to LD1881. Um, I'm sorry about the confusion that had another client listed there. Um, the Maine Auto Dealers Association is the association of all new car and truck dealers uh, in the state of Maine, over, uh, over 100 of such, and they represent or they have as employees some 6,000 employees. Uh, as I said, I'll be very brief. Uh, given all of the uh, comments and questions that Ms. Brogan received, um, I wouldn't have anything to add beyond that, uh, other than to say that um, an auto dealership is, in many ways, a dangerous place to work. People have to get in and out of cars, drive cars in and out, um, deal with hot engines and hot parts of cars while they're repairing them. And, um, and I do think that um, being able to um, not being able to consider medical marijuana just as you consider anything else, uh, I think is, um, is going to have unintended consequences. I think it could inhibit uh, the ability to come to uh, agreements, uh, especially as it relates to work capacity and, and this ambiguous phrase engaging in conduct. Um, and I also would suggest that we have very capable hearing officers and they are able to parse through testimony quite effectively. And um, it certainly could become relevant. And um, we would respectfully suggest that it shouldn't be prohibited from being considered. And with that, Senator, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions the committee might have, especially being mon mindful of the late hour. Thank you so much. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Seeing none, I think you're getting spared by the old phrase of don't be the one standing between lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Tony Payne, you're up next. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to have to switch screens here so I can get to my testimony. But before doing that, I'd just like to offer a reset for the committee on what this bill is about. And I think Elizabeth Brogan uh, captured it, but I just want to make sure that we're all in agreement. <clears throat> the crux of the bill is to remove from consideration understanding that an injured worker is using medical marijuana. It's not about the legality of marijuana. It's not about the appropriateness of it. <clears throat> it's simply that it's removing that from consideration in adjudication of conflicts or outcomes. So with that, let me move to my uh, 
formal testimony, and then I'll be ready for questions. <clears throat> so, Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester, and members of the committee. My name is Tony Payne. I'm the Senior Vice President of External Affairs at MEMIC, Maine's largest workers' compensation insurance company. We provide insurance for approximately 18,000 Maine employers in six across 16 counties with coverage for their estimated 200,000 employees. First, we are pleased with the provision in this bill of not compelling insurers to reimburse injured workers for medical marijuana, given the conflict it poses with federal law. However, we cannot support section three of the bill. This provision essentially removes from the adjudication of claims relevant information and the settlement of disputes. And here are the four reasons to oppose LD 1881. If medical marijuana use is suppressed information, parties to a workers' comp dispute will lack relevant facts when addressing important issues such as work capacity or ability to work. This also would impact an employer's ability to investigate workplace accidents. It would be akin to not knowing a person's reliance on insulin for diabetes if an adverse reaction caused them to black out on the job and cause their injury or injuries to others. Two, since there are no other laws that provide special protection, or masking of drug use in the workers' compensation system, it seems unnecessary, if not counterproductive, to exempt medical marijuana. Furthermore, it prevents employers the ability to provide a safe place of work. Third is the law currently allows an employer to take action if an employee is impaired and, and presents a danger to themselves or to those with whom they work. Not knowing if, the med if medical marijuana contributed to a person's impairment when an injury occurs is contrary to the foundation of creating a safe workplace. It also impacts an employer's ability to assure their employees and the public are not at risk by drug-induced impairment, such as driving a school bus or operating municipal water facilities. And fourth, it also seems this proposal is being offered to address a situation that is seldom, if ever, an issue uh, that comes before the Workers' Compensation Board. Our interest is, is to prevent workforce injuries, and if they do occur, to help injured workers regain their health and safety and safely return to work. Having all relevant information available when issues come before the Workers' Compensation Board helps preserve fair treatment for everyone who relies on this system. That's why we ask the committee to vote in opposition to LD. 1881. I also add that uh, Mr. McCarrier's comments I thought were in, in fact supportive of opposition because as he said, let's bring medical marijuana out of the shadows. Let's not mask it. Let's make it part of the conversation because it has bearing on the conversation. The other point that uh, Representative hey, Sylvester Payne, raised, you, that is yes. that is the end of your time. If you could, it is. If you could wrap it up. That'd be okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to move to uh, a comment. Uh, you were kind enough to make. This isn't about use of medical marijuana at home. It can be in the car before you go to work. It can be at any time. This is not relegated to nights and weekends. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Do you have any questions from the committee at this time? Representative Warren. Thank you for your comments. I do think that there's some points you raised that are absolutely decent, and I I want to I want to uh, thank you for um, kind of referencing other testimony and responding to it. And maybe as part of that, um, I'll follow in that trend to say, um, do you feel there is a a stigma that is in part you know in, has been in, institutionalized? Do you think there is a legitimate um, case here that there is a history of um, you know ways that the stigma around marijuana has um, yeah, I guess, do you feel there's a fair, a fair point on the, on the other side there at all? I think we're all making strides forward. Um, the stigma, I believe, has been dropped uh, substantially since, the, um, since marijuana was legalized. I was a medical marijuana user. I want to tell you, though, uh, it was trying to treat pain that nothing else seemed to be able to touch, and neither did the marijuana. Um, what was also interesting, though, and I've, I got to say is, you know, growing up in the uh, 60s and 70s, um, it's not my dad's marijuana. Um, it is a different beast altogether, uh, whether it be medical or, or now recreational. 
Uh, and I ended up throwing out everything that I had purchased through the um, dispensary simply because it was something that was not dosed uh, and it was not appropriate uh, for trying to solve what I needed to be solved. But it is a different beast. And I do, I really wanted that to be clear. To the, to the stigma, now nah, I have no problem talking about it even. Uh, and I think that everybody else should feel free be, because it is a legal substance. Do you have any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your time, Mr. Payne. Thank you, I appreciate it. Of course. Um, do I have anyone else here to testify in opposition? Seeing no hands going flying up in the waiting room, we're going to transition to those testifying neither for nor against on this measure. Um, first up, we have Peter Gore, followed by John Rohde. Let's... Bring Peter Gore in. They should be coming in, uh, Senator Daugherty. Perfect. Mr. Gore, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Before uh, Senator Daugherty and Representative Sylvester, before you start the three minute clock, Representative Sylvester, um, I just did want to say, uh, pass on my condolences and my deepest sympathies to this committee for the loss of both uh, Representative Tuttle and Representative Doerr. Um, I, sir, I, I appeared before the committee when uh, Representative Tuttle was both the chair and a member of this committee, and when Representative Doerr was a member of this committee as well. Um, they were fine people and fine legislators. I especially appreciated their respectfulness. Um, They're willing to listen and work with all parties, and it is a loss to the legislature in the state. Um, so my condolences. With that, my name is Peter Gore. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, and I'm here to speak regarding LD 1881. Um, there's a lot going on with this bill. Um, I think it's probably obvious to the committee members. Um, and we did meet with the sponsor, Elizabeth and I did, to chat about what it was she was seeking to, to try and rectify. And um, I think part of the issue for this committee to take into account is that marijuana as a public policy issue whether it's recreational or it's medicinal, is an evolving public policy. Um, and one of the aspects that we try to work with, the, particularly the Marijuana Implementation Committee, is to make sure that the workplace remained a safe workplace and employers did not have to worry about employees um, being impaired in the workplace, whether it was for through the use of recreational or medicinal marijuana. Um, we are certainly opening to uh, addressing the concerns that Representative Dillingham brought forth, but I'm not sure this bill does it. Um, and, and what it does do, however, is open the door for people, um, as has been indicated, to through the use of medical marijuana in the workplace, um, and thus creating an unsafe work environment for not only the individual employee, but the, their fellow employees as well. Um, and I'm not, I, I really don't think that was the intent of the bill, but that's where we find ourselves. Um, I, I would point out that like a lot of things um, with regards to both recreational and medicinal marijuana, there are a lot of conversations taking place now um, amongst employers um, and insurers, particularly in the workers' comp world when it comes to pain control. Um, and while employers, insurers, excuse me, can't be compelled to pay for medical marijuana, I know there are many that would prefer to do it because it helps alleviate questions around the use of opioids, uh, mitigate the impact of an addiction, um, and has met, and can be as uh, successful, if not more successful, when it comes to controlling pain. Um, there are obviously uh, barriers to that. The, mo the most significant is it remains a Schedule One drug, according to the United States government. Um, and that was the basis of the Burgoyne decision, which has been referenced here this morning, this afternoon. Um, as we go forward, we're certainly willing to work with the committee to try and address the concerns here. Um, but what our greatest concern remains to not even through uh, an, an accidental way, open the door for an unsafe workplace. And with that, I'll wrap up my testimony and try and answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Do I have any questions from the committee at this time? Looks like we're gonna let you off the hook there. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. And um, 
up next, we have John Rohde. Welcome back. All right. Uh, thank you, Senator Daughtry and Senator Daughtry, Representative Sylvester and members of the Joint uh, Committee on Labor and Housing. I am John Rohde, the Executive Director of the Workers' Compensation Board. I am here this afternoon to testify on behalf of the board, neither for nor against LD 1881, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have or provide any information uh, you might need. Uh, thank you. That wins for shortest testimony of the day. <laughs> Um, do you have any questions for further information from Mr. Rohde? Seeing none, uh, thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, last chance. I see our numbers in the attendee list are dwindling greatly, but is there anyone here who had um, intended to testify neither for nor against? Not seeing any. Do I have any questions from the committee for analysts before we close this out? And not seeing any either, I will officially close the public hearing on LD 1881. Thank you, Representative Dillingham for presenting it. Um, we do have a large list of work sessions. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I do think my brain and everything could use a reset. So if it's all right, let's take a 15 minute break. Everyone stretch, grab some water and come back refreshed and ready to start all over again. Oh, Representative Bradstreet. Yes. Uh... Madam Chair, a couple of us would like to know if we're going to have a breakout session prior to this. Yes. Uh, Representative Sylvester, I don't know if you had a, a question or response to that. I had um, a response to that, which was if folks want to go ahead and reminding that for the work sessions, we're using a separate link. Um, if you want to go ahead and sign into that, then you can ask Mr. Purvis to set you up and set us up in break rooms. And people who are returning will see an invitation to join in a break room that they can then take or not. So we'll say um, roughly 15 minutes for a break and then we'll immediately go into, I guess, our corner caucuses and then come back. Is that what I'm hearing, Mr. Bradstreet? I'm still trying to learn the ways of the committee. So just wanna make sure I have everything in order. I think that would be fine, thank you. Okay. Um, and then Senator Guerin, did I see your hand up followed by Senator Hickman? I was just going to ask about that being after the 15 minute break, because I would like the break. <laughs> we all need some lunch and some water and some stretching. <laughs> and I'm sure most of us have you know, dogs that need letting out or you know, checking in with some loved ones. Senator Hickman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to ask if we could extend that break a little bit. Sure. I'm not in my kitchen or near it today, so it's going to be a little bit longer for me to get food. So I was hoping maybe 25 minutes, a half an hour. I know we have a long day, but <laughs> that's just what my request would be. I would be amenable to half an hour for those who have cameras. Uh, let's do a str uh, actually raise your hand if you were diametrically opposed to a half an hour. Not seeing any, all those in favor of taking a little bit of longer lunch and hitting recess, unofficial straw poll. Okay, everyone, Thank go you. get some Thank food. You. Thank you. <laughs> I'll see Thank you, you all soon.